Well, members, we're, ab we're about to go uh, live. Um, so, uh, no, you don't need to behave, just, you know, get yourself ready for a fun time. Um, okay, we're good, we're, we're live. Welcome members, anyway, thank you all very much. Um, and to our internet visitors, uh, welcome. Uh, to this meeting of the New Eastern Committee. My name is uh, Paul Rivers, and I have the pleasure of chairing this committee. Um, tonight, uh, we are all supported by uh, a set of officers, Lewis Jones, our planning solicitor, Marie Clark, area team leader, Rebecca Oates, principal planning officer, Kate Edwards, principal planning officer, Alex Inglis, uh, Senior Planning Officer, uh, Fiona Cameron, our illustrious Senior Governance Officer, and Georgina Hall, Georgina equally illustrious, if I may say, uh, Democratic Services Officer, who's going to be clerking the meeting. And uh, public speakers, just to remind you, uh, as we have some this evening, good. Um, Please keep your statements brief and to the point. Obviously, you will. Uh, we will be timing speeches this evening, and an alarm will sound when you have been speaking for four minutes, and a little warning as well. So, moving then to our meeting, uh, item one on the agenda. Um, Georgina, do we have any apologies received or, or any substitutions? Yes, Chairman. Apologies have been received from Councillor David Earls. Councillor Val Henry is acting as his substitute. Late apologies have also been received from Councillor Joan Hegan. Thanks, Georgina. Uh, item two, um, minutes of the last meeting. Um, uh, the minutes of the meeting held on the 28th of September uh, 2021 have been published on the Councillor's, uh, our Councillor's website. Um, members, are you happy to confirm these minutes as accurate? Great. Great, thank you very much. Item three, declarations of interest. Georgina, do we have any declarations of inter interest? None was received before the meeting, but I believe Councillor Gray wants to say something. Councillor Gray, please. Thank you. In connection with um, item A1, I am a member of the Dunsford Parish Council where this was discussed. I did not take part in or vote for an outcome on that. And I have been in the past a member of the Neighbourhood Plan Development Group, although I stepped back from that over 12 months ago. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you, Councillor. Are we okay with that, Georgina? Yeah, thank you. Um, now, questions by members of the public. Georgina, have you received any? None received. Sorry, uh, Chairman, I did have my hand waving around about declarations of interest. Sorry, let's go back. Sorry. Okay, Apologies, please. I was That's waving. Right. Um, I, would, I would just like to, to say that um, I am a member of Cranley Parish Council, but I haven't taken place in any discussions around planning um, applications, and I'm not a member of the planning committee. Um, I'm also portfolio holder for economic development, but I haven't and I don't take part in any discussions or comments on planning applications that are referred to the team. And also, I would just like to point out that I am a member of Friends of the Earth, but I have not been involved in any consultation whatsoever regarding any of the applications. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Townsend. So, uh, Georgina, any questions uh, from received from members? None received. And now over to Marie, who I think will update us with any new government guidance or legislation. Marie? Thank you, Chair. Um, nothing to update. Right. Thank you very much. So that takes us on then to, uh, uh, well, effectively item eight. This is uh, item A1, <coughs> WA 2021-0413, land north of Grattan Chase. Dunsfold. And who is it? Rebecca? That's good. No, it's not Rebecca. It, <clears throat> it okay. is right. Rebecca's application, but I'm going to present for her. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Okay. 
Okay, hopefully you can hear me okay. So this is an application for land north of Grattan Chase in Dunsfold. It's for the erection of 21 dwellings, including eight affordable, together with associated access, parking and landscaping. Now there is an update sheet for members, which clarifies that there's no objection raised by the heritage officer and there are amendments proposed to some of the conditions so that they relate to ecology and the information can be reviewed by Surrey Wildlife Trust. So moving on to the location plan, you can see here that the site is outlined in red and it's to the east of Dunsfold Common Road. It's accessed by a Grattan Chase which serves the development to the south Coombrey Cottage lies to the immediate north and there are paddocks and fields to the east of the site associated with this property. And there is the common to the west with residential properties beyond. Next there is the aerial view plan. Uh, this puts the site into context with the wider area. There is a play area immediately to the south in the Grattan Chase development and also onto the northwest across the common, and Dunsfold Village lies to the south. And the next slide shows site constraints. The site falls within the countryside beyond the Greenbelt and the AGLV. The settlement boundary and conservation area boundary are to the south of the site, which you can see in blue. And public footpath and bridleways are shown in pink and green to the north. Uh, please ignore the black lines, they relate to legal agreements. Then we have site photographs. This shows the existing, <coughs> existing access off of Dunsfold Common Road, which is known as Grattan Chase, of which the application site will be accessed, as shown on the left photo. And on the right photo, it's the existing access point to the site. The next photo, the top left is looking north from the access, top right is looking east from the access, and the bottom picture shows internal trees within the site. And the final photographs, show the adjacent development at Grattan Chase, including the play area. Then the proposed site plan. This shows the proposal, so they're seeking full permission for 21 dwellings, including eight affordable, which equates to 38% affordable housing, and a density of approximately 20 dwellings per hectare. Access would be to the southwest with a circular internal road network. Parking consists of garages, driveways, and unallocated spaces dotted around outside of the road. Landscaping to take place, and this would be secured by condition. Then the next slide shows how the proposal would sit alongside existing residential development to the south. So you've got the Grass and Chase development, which is 42 units to the immediate south. And then beyond that, there's the Nugent Close 21 unit development. The next slide shows the dwelling sizes and the affordable units. So there would be a flatted block in the southeastern corner, and this would feature one and two bed flats a mixture of two, three and four bed houses. And then the affordable units you can see are clustered to the south of the site where the blue dots are. Officers consider this isn't ideal. However, given the size of the development, it is acceptable in this instance. Discussion is still ongoing with registered providers at present. However, rent levels are likely to be set at 60 to 70% of market value which is considered acceptable. The next slide shows lighting. They're proposing bollards, but this would be part of a condition. Let me move on to the proposed elevations. 
This is the proposed flatted unit with, uh, sorry, flatted building containing four units. And then there would be on the next slide, a mixture of affordable and market units. All of these would be two storey in height, featuring gables and porch detailing. Materials would include red brickwork, timber cladding, plain roof tiles and grey front doors and windows. The next slide shows garages, which would be single storey with pit pitched roofs. And then we move on to the street scenes where you can see the proposed materials. So the top one is along the eastern boundary, middle along the western and the bottom street scene shows the southern boundary with the flatted units on the right hand side. Then we have the tree plan. The internal trees are to be removed and five trees in the southwestern corner removed in connection with the site access and trees would be retained on the boundaries. So the key matters for consideration, that I'll set out on that the slide, and as set out in the agenda report, the site falls outside the settlement boundary and its development is acknowledged by officers to result in the loss of a visual buffer between existing development to the north and south of Dunsfold. There would be an inevitable visual impact and impact on character of the area through developing the site. No play area is to be provided on site and there would be a slight deviation from the SMAR in terms of housing mix. However, a tilted balance is applicable owing to the council's housing land supply status. Officers consider that the identified visual character impact would be localised and development of the site would be seen as a natural extension to existing development. All dwellings would accord with the technical space standards and residents would have access to the existing play area to the immediate south of the development, as well as an opportunity to visit Dunterfold play area to the northwest of the site across the common. So subject to recommended conditions, which would secure measures in relation to a number of technical matters, including drainage, highways and ecology, no objection is raised by officers. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Marie. Now, I understand that we have uh, three um, public speakers. Um, first on my list is Mr. Simon Benson. Hi there, good evening. Uh, Mr. Benson, please go ahead. You have four minutes and, and we will prompt you towards the end of that time. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Drainage. Thames Water report the inability of the existing foul water network infrastructure to cope and have identified that no capacity exists to serve the development with upgrades required. This is exactly what Vanderbilt Homes and Thames Water were supposed to implement when Grattan Chase was built, and yet houses have been occupied since May 2019 with no improvements. The requirement for emergency storage is 160 litres per dwelling per day. The wells serving both Nugent Close and Grattan Chase holds only 1,147 litres. Approving this application would mean 13,440 litres per day, nearly 12 times too much. Currently, in the event of a power cut, we have around four hours before the sewage backs up in Nugent Close. Flooding. The LLFA report states, the proposed final solution will effectively manage the one in 30 and one in 100 storm event assumptions. I've lived here for two winters and the land in question has flooded both times. This test desktop assessment underestimates the probability of further localized flooding and the potential for this to impact local residents. Defer a call for projects to restore natural systems to hold back rainwater. Building on this land will do the opposite. Policy CC4 of the local plan states you must not increase the flood risk elsewhere. The new development in Hascom, reference WA 2017-2309, flooded recently after heavy rain. Residents had warned of this. Settlement boundary. The development would constitute unrestricted growth into the countryside. This would be outside the settlement boundary, which is contrary to national and local planning policy. If planning goes ahead, what meaning does settlement boundary have? The area east is with an area of great landscape value. Therefore, planning is in contravention of policy RE3 of the local plan. Visual character of the locality would be adversely affected, contrary to policies D7 and NE1 of the local plan. 
the green buffer that exists between the settlement boundary at Grattan Chase and rural properties will essentially be eradicated. In addition, the site is contrary to policies RE1, D1, D4, HA1, HE3, CC1, CC2 and CC4 of the local plan. Neighbourhood plan. There has been over 80 objections to this application from the local community. The recent neighbourhood plan rejected the suitability of this site for development and made the case for a number of better alternatives. When consulted, 99% of respondents voted to oppose further building at the north end of the village. Housing need. What justification for building in the village? One affordable home on Grattan Chase is still unoccupied and it was built in 2019. Has there been a consultation regarding the need for affordable houses in village? There's a poor bus service and the nearest railway station is six miles away. Road access. The entry to Bratton Chase is narrow and now has a lowered curb for the amphibian migration with heavy construction traffic accessing the site. This would be dangerous for pedestrians, especially children, as vehicles would be highly likely to mount the curb. The road has already been repaired once and in the last few days begun to crack again. Who will be liable for further damage to the road if the application is approved and who has given consent for its use? Biodiversity. The land and surrounding area is home to a plethora of wildlife, including the protected great crested newt, frogs and toads, who annually migrate to the large pond on the common. It is next to a site of nature conservation importance to the south, sorry, to the west adjoining common land. There will be needless removal of established trees, hedgerows and woodland planted with money from a grant, as well as displacing or endangering local wildlife. Policies NPPF 2012, LPP1 and ME1 are not being met. It would be scandalous to consider this development would have a net gain to biodiversity. The BBC recently reported the UK is one of the world's most nature depleted countries in the bottom 10% and last in the G7. Amphibians are highest risk of extinction. We must play our part and not be complicit in the willful destruction of nature. It is for these reasons the residents of Dunsfold object strongly to this application. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Benson. That was excellently timed, if I may say so. Now, uh, we have another speaker, Mr. Copping. Uh, Spencer Copping, are you there? Hi, thank you. Can um, you hear me okay? Yep, over to you in four minutes, sir. I'd like to thank the uh, chair and fellow members of the committee for allowing me to speak uh, this evening on behalf of the applicant. The proposal seeks the erection of 21 dwellings, including eight affordable houses, and follows a pre-application submission, public consultation, and presentation to the parish council in line with best practice. The principle of the redevelopment of the application site is not in doubt given the requirements of the local plan for the provision of new housing in the village. The council's lack of a five-year housing land supply adds further importance to ensuring local homes are delivered in sustainable locations. This application site also represents a logical extension to the Grattan Chase development to the south and we say makes a more meaningful contribution towards the housing numbers required in the village. The proposal seeks to provide much needed high quality market and affordable homes, which would make the best use of the land whilst respecting the character and appearance of the local area. The affordable housing provision is also above the policy requirement, which is a, is a substantial benefit of the proposal. The application site is located within a sustainable location and the proposal adheres to the relevant national, regional and local planning policy. The MPPF recognises the important contribution to be made by small and medium sites to meeting the housing requirements and are often built out relatively quickly. With regard to design, the applicant has chosen to use the same architect that designed the Grattan Chase development to the south of the application site, ensuring continuity in terms of design. The proposed dwellings would have two storeys and pitched roofs and propose a good mix of units in line with council requirements. The traditional building forms work well with contemporary detailing and would not detract from the character of the area. The amenity of neighboring occupiers has been carefully considered throughout the design process the scheme incorporates sufficient separation distances to neighbouring properties and provides a quality layout with boundary screening retained. The scale and form of the dwellings sit well within the site and comprise a net density comparable to the Grattan Chase development. The proposal would provide a high standard of accommodation for future residents with generous gardens proposed for each property. With regards to flooding and drainage, the applicants have worked with the lead local flood authority and Thames Water to ensure a package of measures are put in place to address foul and surface water drainage. Thames Water have also confirmed that their ongoing modelling for a permanent solution for Grattan Chase will also include the site before you. With regard to trees and biodiversity, the proposal seeks to incorporate sufficient room for additional planting and ensure the proposal protects and enhances biodiversity and no objection has been raised to the proposal by Natural England or the Surrey Wildlife Trust subject to standard conditions. 
The Highway Authority have confirmed that the proposal would provide policy compliant parking and would not contribute, contravene any recognized highway standards. The proposal seeks a high quality mix of dwellings in a sustainable location. The applicant has provided all necessary specialist evidence to confirm that the proposal addresses matters relating to drainage, highways, landscaping, trees, archaeology, contaminated land and flood risk. It is therefore respectfully requested that the case officer's recommendation be upheld by the members of the Eastern Planning Committee and the application be granted. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Copping. And uh, we have uh, Mr. Hayward, Stephen Hayward from Dunsfold Parish Council, I believe. Yes, good evening. Oh, thank you, Stephen. Go ahead, please. Um, thank you for giving us the opportunity to speak this evening. Um, as we've already heard, Thames Water have, oh, I'm just being asked to start my video. Okay. Thames Water um, have already expressed an inability of the existing foul water network, and the Parish Council remains of the view that this application should be deferred until there is a legally binding agreement between all the affected parties and a condition to the effect that new dwellings cannot be occupied until the additional infrastructure has been commissioned. In addition to this, it's become clear over the past three years that the entire village foul drainage system, including the pumping station constructed in 1963, can no longer cope with demand. Whilst on paper, it appears to have sufficient capacity to accommodate additional housing, the reality, as explained by Thames Water in a public village meeting, is that when a period of heavy rainfall occurs, the ingress of surface water overwhelms the system. The result is that the community has to endure a fleet of tankers for days and weeks at a time to supplement the pumping station and prevent sewage contamination, causing huge disruption. The most sensible situation uh, solution would appear to us to be that any new development should provide its own foul drainage system on site, as was the case with the recent very successful development of, of affordable housing in Miller Lane, which was completed last year. In relation to the uh, affordable housing, the officers didn't respond to our request that the affordable housing should be subject to a cascade, giving preference to residents with some local connection with Dunsfold before going to the main Waverley housing list. Such a cascade is imposed on the affordable housing provided on the rural exception sites in Dunsfold, and the Parish Council believes that this is what's helped to make, make them such a success. Such a cascade acknowledges that not everyone on the main housing list will settle well into a rural village community, which has few facilities and requires residents to have access to a car because many day-to-day -day living requirements are not a simple walk away from one's home. These are things that local people are used to and actually positively enjoy. Therefore, if councillors are inclined to accept the officer's recommendation, the Parish Council would like to see the envisaged resultant Section 106 agreement relating to affordable housing to include a local cascade. In reference to parking, we've learned from parking problems in the adjacent Grattan Chase that parking issues arise because residents don't use garages for their intended purpose, but instead use them for storage or additional living accommodation. Not only has this application under provided dedicated parking space by five compared with the council's guidelines, 12 of the spaces are in the form of garages, which potentially mean an under provision of 17 resident specific spaces. This is clearly going to cause problems and the parish council would like to see open barn style parking, which would not only be more in keeping with the local vernacular, but help prevent such parking issues. Finally, as you'll be aware, in July this year, the MPPF was updated to include the word beautiful in relation to housing design as a social objective. People live in communities and neighborhoods, streets and landscapes, not simply in homes. So we believe that architects and everyone else involved in delivering new homes need to start with the ambition to create great neighborhoods and communities full of identity and vibrancy. Policymakers ask us to deliver more homes but the challenge is delivering great communities, places where we can all aspire to live. I'm sure you're all familiar with the government inspired report, Distinctively Local, which provides guidance on building beautiful buildings in the countryside. And it says that mere lip service is too often paid to the specifics of context, resulting in the superficial application of local materials and building elements. This might be pitched roofs or decorated barge boards retrieved from a cursory overview of the local vernacular. And this is precisely what we're seeing here. Um, 
So I'd just like to sum up by saying it appears to us that the current lack of five-year housing supply is tipping the balance over everything else. And that if this permission is given, Dunsfold, which is already providing a far higher percentage of new housing compared with the other small villages, will be saddled with a poorly conceived development. 30 seconds over time. When if properly considered, our village could benefit from a new vibrant addition to the community. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Hayward. Thank you very much. Uh, now, members, as you know, uh, officer's recommendation is that permission be granted subject to conditions 1 to 33 and informatives 1 to 16. Uh, any views, members, please? Councillor Gray. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, I think we all recognise the five-year housing supply and the effective uh, tilted balance. I mean, we are waiting for the LPP2 to, be, to come forward, which is very close and an update to the five-year housing supply. Um, I, I see the other issue here that we've got to address is the squeezing in of an additional two affordable houses over the 30%. So it's considered to be a significant benefit. Um, the site itself is outside the settlement boundary, which is not the adjacent site, but actually Nugent's close, this one further on. Dunsfold's a rural, um, is rural and the next door Grattan Chase was in fact phase two of the Nugent's 100% affordable local connection and was included in the LAR. This area has been considered for AONB, Surrey Hills Review, and currently is AGLV. The site was read under the LAR and the neighborhood plan consultation identified other sites as more preferable, including brownfields and previously developed land. The LAR identified another site in the village with potential for 40 houses as a green site, and Dunsfold has completed 63 additional dwellings out of a target of 100, including more than 30% affordable. The settlement has some 200 houses, and this plus Grattan Chase would make a 30% increase. That's a 30% increase in a very small area. Um, Dunsfold Parish is extensive and there are other opportunities to spread houses around, including Brownfield site, as we have said. I hope members have noted Thames watered infrastructure and foul waste issues, plus the comments that have been made by the two speakers. Uh, the main pumping station in Dunsfold and Hascombe is having frequent ta uh, tanker removals. Um, we have a, a, a major infrastructure issue with, within in the village, which has got to be addressed. It's currently making some of this, the residents in Nugent's and uh, Grattan's Chase life very unpleasant. Um, the site is next to a registered county parish holding. The officers have described it as an equestrian property. It's not, it's a registered county parish holding, which is much more extensive than just an equestrian. It has the ability to keep sheep, pigs, goats, chickens, as well as horses. And most of those animals, in fact, are rescue. And you are going to effectively impose noise on these animals, some of which are sensitive, um, and you potentially could condemn this facility. This facility basically consumes £3,000 per month of local supplies and local services. That's local to the village. It's a very important part of the rural structure of Dunsfold. The, duffer, the buffer between the site and the road is today being thinned out. And we're talking here the buffer between the site and the Dunsfold Common Road. It's on common. It was due to be uh, coppiced and dead trees removed and thinned as part of the common management plan that the parish council basically undertakes. The site will therefore become visible from the road, contrary to the comments, comments by officers and the applicant. The site is, in, in our view and the view of many residents, overdeveloped, crowded, and with another eight affordable houses which offer no local connection. I won't go into that, it's been referred to before, but Grattan Chase provided 17 with a much better layout and they are still having trouble basically getting rid of the last house. The allocation is not in line with the SMA. It's included any uh, lap or leap. And I remember at this meeting some time ago on Grattan's Chase, 
being told by the planning officers it was imperative we have a lap or a leap and they would not accept the local play area as a substitute. One law for Grattan's Chase, one law for here. Let's have some consistency, please. Um, it doesn't, it under provides on the parking. It offers little for the new residents. Uh, the application affordable rents will only be possible with external funding. And as identified, rents do need to be reduced below the 80% threshold, as was being discussed in the previous application. The visual impact is considered to be local. So the visual impact is not important to local people, um, but I would argue that the visibility is a lot wider than that. It is available. It is visible from the AONB Haskham Hill, from the footpaths, and also to the fact that Dunsfold's a magnet for walkers and visitors. We get a lot of visitors. And in part, that's why it's been considered for the inclusion in the extended AONB. This urbanization will affect the justification of what has been a carefully constructed plan to expand the village in keeping with its history and the area of outstanding natural beauty. The link to Grattan Chase. Um, is... Councillor, forgive me, but I would like you to wind up a bit. I've otherwise, got... we'll be. Yeah, I will just keep it. There's a couple of points if you don't mind. Please me, go ahead then, as right? quick as you can. The link to Grattan Chase is like the field link to Newton's Close. Newton's Close was and Grattan's Chase were meant to have a link, but legally it wasn't possible. We've got a link proposed here, but you're talking about different ownerships, different structure. Will that link be possible? Waverley Estates have objected due to the access being agricultural. A large easement was paid on Grattan's Chase. And would any easement here affect the, vi the viability and subsequently see us come back with a renegotiation of terms? The site field is the last route of amphibians through to the birthing ponds. Recent groups of volunteers carried frogs and toads and newts across the road for the second year. Finally, the increased traffic will add risk to the local swans on a dangerous stretch of road and has seen, which has seen various crashes over the last 12 to 18 months. Uh, the swans have been hit by traffic coming around the, the blind bend. Um, and the people who have to walk along the thin path, disabled people and mothers are inches away from the vehicles coming along the Dunsfold Common Road at 40 miles per hour. Nothing can be done about the speed because we're told the traffic is too fast for us to reduce it to 30. If the applicant wants this approved, it seems to me that it needs to address the concerns and the failure to meet policy, reduce the numbers, make the design beautiful and bring back a new application addressing all these points. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will stop there. And if I could come back for a very brief time at the end as the local ward councillor, I'd appreciate it. Councillor, thank, thank you for that. But uh, just as a note, I would, as chair, prefer shorter comments so that people can actually assimilate uh, the key points that you have. I'm only talking for myself now, but thank you. Now, members, with, with, I have... With this, but, Chairman, can I just say that my 14 pages I started with has been drastically reduced. I, I think getting it down to seven was a very good idea. It's well done. Um, members, I have, um, I have uh, Councillor Townsend, Councillor Gale and Councillor Dinas uh, to speak. Um, Councillor Townsend. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, just a, a couple of brief points. Uh, obviously, you went on the site visit, which was really helpful, and uh, there were some issues raised there, and I just would like some um, uh, assurances from um, the plan planners that, uh, that we, planning officers rather, that, that they have been looked into. Um, one of them was regarding um, boundary treatments on the properties because of the amphibians that are, are um, local to this site. And uh, we did actually see the toad people there. Um, I just uh, wondered if we could add as a condition um, uh, or an informative, probably an informative about um, soft boundary treatments, landscaping, um, so that um, we don't create barriers for the local wildlife. Um, we mentioned about a TPO on one of the oak trees that was on the 
uh, boundary of the site with um, Gatton Close and um, whether or not that's been looked into. Um, one of the things that I'm a bit concerned about as well is the um, Thames Water, obviously, um, saying there's an inability of the existing foul water network and also of the um, water network. And, and, and I'm curious as to why this hasn't been, I don't think it's been added as a condition. I think it's just been added as an informative. Um, and I don't think that I could, um, if I was thinking of supporting this, which I haven't made my mind up yet at all, um, I don't think that I could support anything that, that didn't have that as an actual condition, because it, it is quite a serious, um, well, it's a very serious um, situation. So perhaps that could be clarified. And apologies if I've overlooked it, but I, can I just say that I did have quite a few issues with the planning portal today. And, and so I'm coming to this a little bit, um, you know, a le less prepared than I normally am. Um, uh, so, so really those are my questions, first of all, um, about um, the boundary treatments, the TPO, whether it's possible to put some TPOs on the larger trees there, um, also about the Thames water condition. And, and, and finally, we were also advised that the suds on the um, adjacent um, application, uh, not application, the adjacent housing, also were not very toad and amphibian friendly and that there were they were finding some drowned toads and that within the drainage system and and that was something else we were asking again to be included um, was that the um, drainage system took into account the local um, wildlife as well so thank you chairman thank you councillor townsend uh, i wonder if we can get uh, rebecca or marie to comment on those points that Councillor mm -hmm. Townsend raised at this stage. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Apologies if I um, have a coughing fit midway through. Um, but just to come back on a, on a couple of points um, with regards to the soft boundary treatment. So on the update sheet, we have um, suggested an amendment to the reasons for the boundary treatment itself. But um, there's no reason why we couldn't impose a, an informative just to expand on that and just refer to um, soft boundary treatment should not result in barriers um, to ecology. The, um, the point on the Thames Basin. So there are two conditions that were recommended by, uh, sorry, Thames Basin, um, Thames Water. There were con two conditions that were recommended by Thames Water. Those are conditions 25 and 26. Uh, those, are, those have come from Thames Water as a result of uh, them highlighting the inability of the existing infrastructure. And also the informative was recommended as well. So we've put, on, put in place what, what's come from the Thames Water comment so hopefully that's that's addressed that point. Um, I've just checked my mapping system and, and there aren't any TPOs showing on my mapping system. Now it might just be um, an error on the system, but I believe that they're there outside of the application site and obviously they would have been fully considered um, by our tree officer and we're satisfied that there's no objection there on tree grounds. If I've missed anything, please do let me know, but um, I hopefully, hopefully that's addressed everything that was raised. Thank you. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, Councillor Townsend, is that correct? Yes, and just about the, the potential, just to make perhaps a comment on the suds as well, about the um, um, uh, any drainage ditches having um, easy access perhaps for amphibians. But the, the, the last point I'd like to make, Chair, and it, and it is about the, the energy of the properties. Um, it does seem that they're going for gas boilers, and um, I'm, I just would like an explanation why we're not insisting um, on an alternative form of heating. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Um, let me move on to uh, Councillor Gale, please, and then Councillor Dinas, and after that, Councillor Darcy. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think Councillor Townsend has actually brought up most of the things that were concerning me. Um, the flooding, uh, I was actually sent this week some very good photographs of flooding, and one of them was taken in exactly the place we saw some photographs in the actual plans today. Um, the entrance was completely underwater. And I know this happens a lot in Dunsfold, and it's not helping the foul drainage, the sewage out there. They have untold problems. Um, I'm concerned about it being quite a way outside of settlement. It, it's said that it's just outside of settlement, but I believe it's quite a way outside because building has taken place. Um, it does concern me. I, I actually like the design. I think the houses are well spaced, 
But um, other than that, I think there are a lot of objections to this site. Um, and I think there are many things that need to be addressed. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. And uh, Councillor Dinas. Thank you, Chair. Um, I know the area particularly well. <clears throat> this is countryside outside the Green Belt. Um, it's already been mentioned, it's outside the settlement and it's AGLV. We have these designations for a reason and we should consider them seriously. It was mentioned, um, I think, by Marie about the affordable homes. And I think Marie says the fact they're clustered, well, this is acceptable. Well, I'm sorry, I don't find it acceptable. It's a small site. Those houses um, could have been scattered around. Um, otherwise, what you're doing is you're putting all the people in affordable houses in one part and they're distinguishable from everybody else. Why it's acceptable, I'm sorry, my personal view, it's not. Um, looking at the design, um, page 12, I think the side views, it reminds me of Kent um, Castle. They look like little um, windows to fire your arrows out of. Is, is really that the best design for views out the side? I just think it looks awful, but there we go. Um, Page 15 and 16, which uh, gives the objections. Could I make a plea to the planning department where they just put objection? Bearing in mind, you cannot get onto the portal for love or money. I, I spent two days trying to look at what the objections were and have given up. You know, the system just crashes and you just wait and wait and wait. Mm -hmm. So saying objection, you know, what good is that to us? So at least a little uh, explanation of why would be really useful because it's the same for most of the other um, applications tonight. I looked at um, obviously 84 objections. It's not part of the neighborhood planned. Um, I looked at some of the legislation RE1 or some of the policies, intrinsic character and beauty, the countryside will be recognized and safeguarded in accordance with the MPF, uh, MPFF. I can't see how that's been done at all. Uh, Waverley's own assessment, page 18, it said it objects. Um, policy RE3, um, AGLV, development must respect and where appropriate enhance the character of the landscape which is located. This does nothing but destroy it. This does get rid of the buffer on the northern side, um, which is recorded on page 23 for my colleagues. How far are we going to extend this? Are we going to wait until it hits Hascombe and then draw them in? That's a buffer is a buffer. It is to stop areas merging into one. I have to admit, policy LRC1, which is the Fields and Trust Guidelines, I totally object to that, saying there's no need for a play area because they can walk to Grattan um, Chase or cross the very, very busy road. The age groups of people who would be on a play area on that sort of design will be quite young. You know, you're talking five, six years old. That's the age that use the all fold. So you're going to expect them to walk from the north of that development all the way through the development, cross the road, go into another state to use that. I'm sorry, that's a breach of a policy, and I'm not happy with that at all. Um, it's been raised about the foul water. Um, again, we're asking permission before we know the system's going to work. And the sewer network, we know it hasn't been agreed. We have a site access, which is a private road. How do we make sure that this is maintained? Are we going to put a condition as we have on others? Um, I, I'm really unhappy with this application. I will, of course, listen to my colleagues, but I'm sorry I couldn't go with the officers at this stage. Thank you, Councillor. So, uh, Councillor Darcy and then Councillor Cosser, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, on page 32, there's a list of measures that this, this development proposes regarding climate change and sustainability. Um, if you look at it, there's nothing that specifically addresses climate change. And it's a list of the most minimal possible measures that anyone could get away with. I mean, for example, it just says boilers and appliances would be energy efficient. Uh, well, great. Um, 
It says energy efficient casement windows, front doors and patio doors will be used. I mean, what does that even mean? This is, we're supposed to be enabling, according to the MPPF, sustainable development. So there's nothing in this that addresses sustainability. It may meet the needs of the present, but the division or the definition of sustainability is, for the, for the purposes of development, meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Right, so while I would say that while this might meet some of the needs of the present, it emphatically compromises the ability of future generations to meet their own needs because it delivers housing that will add to emissions and rather than mitigate climate change, will exacerbate it. So at some future point, those houses will have to be retrofitted to meet our national commitments to be carbon zero by 2050. I think that's unacceptable. I think it's not a sustainable development and therefore under the terms of the MPPF, it should be refused. Regarding biodiversity, far from providing any net gain, well, there's no evidence offered that they will do this. It will then cut some trees down and they're gonna concrete over a load of a field. Um, but worse than that, they're actually building on an area which is known to sustain a thriving population of amphibians, including toads and great crested newts. So as far as I'm concerned, it's delivering biodiversity loss. Um, in, in the Grattan Chase development, we've had a, a number of issues because the original design was supposed to include certain features, which were amphibian safety features for biodiversity um, improvement or uh, mitigation, I suppose, um, but they didn't do them. I mean, they've had to be forced through enforcement. Now in this one, there's not even, they're not even expected to do those minimal things. I'm, I'm really astonished by that. Um, for example, the curbs or the, the, they're supposed to have low curbs so that amphibians can migrate. I mean, we know it's a major migration route. And the drains have to be designed in such a way that the toads and newts don't fall down into them, get trapped. Well, there's no, again, there's no mention of that in this. So apart from all the other issues like the sewage, which to me is a, you know, it's a showstopper. I'm just slightly flabbergasted by this. It's not sustainable and it delivers biodiversity loss. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Darcy. Uh, Councillor Cosser and then Councillor Wilson. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Chair. I, I don't need to say much because a number of the things I might have commented on have already been commented on. Can I just first, before I make my main comment, just ask a, a simple question because it intrigues me. On page 16, we are told that the WBC Estates and Valuation Officer has objected as landowner of adjacent land because they hold the view that any rights granted to the site are for agricultural purposes only. My question is, um, which land and why the objection? Um, I, I genuinely would like to know that. But, but my, my main point is, is this. When I read this application, I think I had a number of concerns, as I often do. That's why a lot of these applications get to committee, because the, there's a balance to be struck somewhere, some of which are the same as those raised by some of my colleagues. Others I don't necessarily share with, with the same degree of intensity. But, but the thing I'm beginning to get just perhaps a little anxious about is, is the, is the statements that, that we see in the report to, to the effect about our five-year uh, supply and the need for a, a, a tilted balance. And, and I really would like some more comment on that. I mean, it may have been in previous reports, but I've not seen it mentioned in those terms before. And I don't, do think it places us as, as members in a, in a somewhat different position. You know, I don't really want coded language. I'd, I'd like to be told a little bit more clearly what the expectation is and what the meaning of the use of that phrase is and how it should determine. Because I'm frankly a bit undecided on, on this at the moment. And I'd like to hear some further comments from our officers about that before I make my mind up. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Cosser. Uh, and finally, Councillor Wilson, and then perhaps I can ask uh, Rebecca or Marie for uh, some of their thoughts on what they've heard. Thank you. I shall try and be very brief, Chairman. Um, aside from all the other aspects of the um, concerns my colleagues have, 
I look at condition 16, which says prior to the first occupation of the development, a verification report carried out by a qualified drainage engineer must be submitted to and approved by the local planning authority. This must demonstrate the surface water drainage system has been constructed as per the agreed scheme and so on. To my mind, if they build it and we then don't have this actual document, it's going to flood. I would say that it should say before construction, they sort the drainage out, not before occupation. And for that reason, I would ask either to defer it or I would be minded not to vote with the officers. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Wilson. Um, now, Councillor Gray, I, I know you, you would like to come in. Right, and, and would you like then for our officers to answer that? Okay, um, Councillor Gray, and then officers, if you can pick up on the few, few other points that have been made, I'd appreciate it. Councillor Gray? Yeah, I think everybody's covered covered a lot of the points, and I'm sorry if I gave too much information in the first place. The road going into Grattan's Chase is a low dig road, and purposely it was designed that way for amphibians and, and everything else. A low dig road will not take the sort of traffic that a construction um, like this will, will will need. Low dig means there's it only goes so far. Um, there are no utilities down that road. The utilities go behind Grattan Chase. Nowhere in here is there, there any indications as to how they're going to bring utilities into the site or how they're going to cover that, that, that issue of the low dig road. There is one other matter which puzzles me a bit um, and it occurred in Miller's Close where the discharge, because it was in that case a private, the discharge of water went outside of the red line and wasn't Thames water, no consultee. This proposal proposed that the discharge will be to the culvert. The culvert is on Waverley land. The culvert and the Waverley land is then leased to Dunsville Parish. Neither Waverley nor Dunsfold Parish have been a consultee on the discharge of the surface water. Thank you. They're my two points. Thank you, Councillor. Um, Rebecca, Marie, would you be able to comment on a couple of those points, please? Hi, yes, Chairman, thank you. If I can just start, and if I miss anything, perhaps Marie can then um, pick things up. But um, just firstly, um, Councillor Coss's um, comments about the common land. So the common land's located to the west of the site. Um, obviously, that being the case, we um, consulted with our estates and tenancy um, team. The reason why they've made the comments that they have is that the applicant would need to separately, outside of the planning process, apply for a section um, 38 application just to ensure that they had the necessary rights. Now, that's a completely separate process. And I understand from our tenancy and estates team that they are already in discussion with the applicant um, to secure that. Um, then just moving on to the tilted balance. So this is really where the MPPF comes into play um, and where councils um, cannot demonstrate a five year housing land supply um, in accordance with the MPPF um, for decision making. It means that um, approval should be should be granted unless there are adverse impacts which significantly and demonstrably outweigh the benefits and that's where a tilted balance as opposed to a straightforward planning balance comes into play. Um, just moving on to um, some comments from Councillor Wilson and reference to condition 16, the verification report. That needs to be read in conjunction with condition 15. Um, both of those conditions are recommended by the lead local flood authority. So condition 15 sets out that the details need to be submitted. Uh, this is in relation to the specific detailed design aspects of the drainage system. 
and those are then what needs to be um, put in place and installed following which condition 16 would get the verification report um, submitted and that would be um, sent to the lead local flood authority for review. Um, thank you very much chairman. <clears throat> Thanks Rebecca. Uh, members are there any points that you want to be picked up at this stage before we cut to the chase? Councillor Townsend and Councillor Gray. Councillor Townsend. Thank you. Um, ju just quickly, whilst Rebecca is um, um, answering questions um, about the lack of the play area, I would like to know um, what the rationale is. Uh, I do, must admit, I, I agree that the, the road there is extremely busy and I don't think it's suitable to be crossing um, to and fro to get to the play area and um, what, why that was uh, deemed not to be, to be necessary. Rebecca. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, first and foremost, obviously, officers had to consider um, the nearest play areas, that being the, um, the play area to the south in Grattan Chase. So that is going to be the main play area that obviously future occupiers of the site would use. There's going to be a footpath connection um, in the southeast corner, and that's, um, that's secured by condition as well. Um, it was just something to note that there was an additional play area um, within the wider Dunsfold area. Um, across the common in, in walking distance. However, it was uh, a carefully balanced um, consideration by officers and we felt that the adjacent play area in Grattan Chase would be sufficient to serve the future occupiers. Thank you. Can, can I just, uh, apologies, can I just for a point of clarification, Chairman, um, is, is not the play area in Grattan Chase um, under their management company? Do not the residents there pay for that particular play park themselves? And therefore, is that not... Um, do they not need their agreement to, to actually allow another housing estate to, to use that play area? Sorry, Rebecca, can you uh, pick up on that, please? Um, yes, as, as far as I know, the occupiers do play, um, pay a, a contribution towards the upkeep and maintenance. Um, and the applicant of this um, <coughs> application has expressed that they would be willing to um, look into providing contributions um, in, in the same way that would ensure then that um, occupiers of this site could then access that play area. Thank you. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, Councillor Gray, and then uh, Councillor Gale, and then Thank I you. do feel we need to uh, yep. move to a decision. My apologies. I'd just like to ask my two questions again because I didn't receive an answer. Sorry, the, please go ahead. The, the one was the low dig road, um, which was an essential part of the original uh, Grattan's Chase low dig road creates some vulnerability, but it was considered acceptable um, because they weren't putting any utilities through it. Um, and then the discharge into the culvert, um, and I mentioned the, the Miller's Close one, which had a similar, similar issue. Um, if you're discharging water off the site into another place, and you also have a risk of overloading a particular pond or a particular area into flooding, then you should consult with the with the landowner. Is my understanding. But could I have an answer on those two questions? Thank you. Thanks, Councillor. So, Rebecca, the low dig road and the culvert close to the proposed entrance. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, the no dig road. Um, we haven't had anything recommended by the council's tree officer with with regard to that. Um, so I'm not sure, um, is that something that you're proposing that we should put on Councillor Gray? Apologies. No, it's recognising the fact that the common entrance into this site is a low dig road. A low dig road will not take a above a certain type. Now it's game to take a refuse vehicle, but as we've seen with the, the original site and building in Grattan's Chase, they did not develop that road until the end and they had a temporary raised surface to allow the, the heavy vehicles to come in. So it was the practicality of the low dig road. And yes, I would want it extended because that's part of the amphibium um, sort of mitigations. That's the word I was looking for. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Councillor Gray. I think in that case, it could be something that could be tied up with the construction um, transport management plan or a construction logistics plan, just to ensure that um, appropriate measures were, you know, and, and the road could take the necessary loading of, of construction related vehicles. 
But I think that's probably the best way to, to address that. Okay, thank you, Rebecca. And lastly, uh, Councillor Gale, please. Oh, sorry, yeah. uh, hang on, Councillor Gale. I'm sorry, but we're talking about discharge into culverts off the red line site into other people's land where you're discharging water. Um, there would be no consultation with either the Dunsville Parish Council or Waverley. Rebecca, that's where the culvert runs in common land. Yes, sorry, Councillor Gray and um, Chairman. I, I just want to consult with um, our legal team on just that aspect, just to know whether that's something that would need to be discussed privately between the landowners outside of the, the planning process or whether that could be incorporated with the drainage related um, matters under the planning process. Thank you, Jim. Uh, please go ahead, Rebecca. Um, meanwhile, Councillor Gale. <laughs> Yeah, just a question. Um, when Councillor Townsend brought up the subject of the Grattan Chase play area, I think Councillor Gray said earlier that there is a proposed footpath through, but that's not been agreed as such. So do, does the actual developer own the land to construct this footpath to go through to the Grattan Chase play area? Or is this similar to what we've seen in Milford where a footpath was designed and said it was going to be there, but actually it couldn't happen? So if that's the case, the children aren't going to be able to play in that play area. They are going to have to go across the road, which Councillor Dina said is totally unnecessary. It, it's wrong. Right. So, Marie, while Rebecca's uh, doing her legal legal bit, uh, can you comment on the uh, on the vi viability of the link into the uh, play area at the bottom east end? Yes, of course, Chair. Uh, if I could refer members to condition 11, it requires the footpath route to be constructed in accordance with the plans. And also, uh, just to point out that part of the section 106 heads of the terms um, is also to provide the, the footpath link, so it's definitely covered. Sorry, Marie. Uh which, which condition? I missed that. I believe it's condition 11. And then also in section four of the report where it says heads of terms, one of those is footpath link on the southern boundary to adjacent play area. Okay, so uh, your view is that uh, Councillor Gale should not have an immediate planning concern about that. That's right, yeah, there would definitely be that that link provided and the the applicant has made that clear that they're happy to do so okay councillor gale well no not really because um i've seen it before where yes we've got a footpath but it actually leads to nowhere because they can't go across a piece of land if they don't own yeah, it Yeah, but that has to be here of course we're talking about this application and not yes any other. yeah i'm talking about this application that councillor gray said that these have been happening in dunsford before but have we got an assurance that that will happen Well, Marie, may I just pick you up on that last question about how sure we are that this is going to happen? This is shown on the proposed site plan. Um, it's labelled as footpath to approved open space area, the res residential development to the south. Um, if they didn't provide it, then we could go down the enforcement route because we've got the condition and the section 106. So. Um, we could certainly, you know, make sure that this is part of the development that is provided. Thanks, Marie. Well, members, we know that planning is an art and not necessarily a, a science in that, in that respect. But I, I suggest, uh, well, firstly, uh, Rebecca, have we got a view on the legal aspect yet? Thank you, Chairman. Yes, we, we're just discussing that at the moment. Um, essentially, we, we've put in place the recommended conditions that... Um, the lead local flood authority have, have outlined to us um, and any issues then arising from that would, would potentially be a private um, a private thing for them to resolve and if they couldn't comply with that i.e provide the drainage strategy that they are proposing um, then it would be something that potentially we could enforce under the breach of condition. Thank you chairman. Thanks Rebecca. Well members I think we've given it a very good uh run through and I thank you all for your comments. Um, as you know, uh, 
officer's recommendation is that permission be granted uh, subject to conditions one to 33 and one to 16 and possibly one or two others that we have yet to consider. But I think uh, based, based on the recommendation as it is, I would like to test the water. Uh, I'd like to bring us to a Councillor Townsend. I'm really sorry, and, and apologies if I've missed it, but I know Councillor Cossa asked about the tilted balance. Did, did, did that ever get explained? I thought it did. In yeah. full, it did. Okay, thank All you right. very much. All right. Could I, could I just say, Sam, and I, I think what I heard, and I think is something I'm now going to weigh in the balance, is, is, is it needs to be, the words I think were significantly, and I've forgotten the other one now, <laughs> but, but effectively, we, we have to be, absolutely um, clear in our minds and give significant weight to, to, to this, more so than perhaps previously. And, you know, we will all take our own view of that. Councillor Darcy? Um, sorry, Chairman. I just wonder if we should uh, consider deferring this <clears throat> until we have some answers from Thames Water. Uh, uh, I Councillor thought, Gossard, as Chairman, you had suggested we'd move to the vote, and I think that's the proper thing well, to do. Um, Councillor well, Darcy, if you'll forgive me, I, I am minded to uh, to move to a vote. Otherwise, we might be here for breakfast on Friday, I think. But, members, uh, based on officer's recommendation that this be granted, may I see those in favour of granting the application as it is? Okay. And may I see those against? Thank you. And if I've got any maths ability, which I don't have, are there any objection? Um, abstentions? No. Okay. Georgina? It's lost. I thought it was quite close, yes. Um, well, in, in, as it stands then, members, we, uh, we are not in favour of this application, so I will be looking now for um, a sensible alternative uh, recommendation. Who would like to give me uh, such a recommendation? Uh, Councillor Townsend and then Councillor Wilson. I'm happy to start, Chairman. Um, I think some of the grounds that it could be refused on is the lack of provision of a play area on site, um, that the impact on the character of the area, um, the um, impact on the landscape, as this is AGLV. Um, I am, I've got written down about the buffer between um, outside the settlement boundary, sorry, um, the buffer between that and uh, there was somebody, I can't remember what the buffer was, but somebody will have to help me on that one. Um, and also, I would like to um, potentially, and I will take officers' advice on this, mention about the climate change and the energy. You know, we have policies CC1 and CC2, and we never, ever seem to be able to use them in any refusal. So it does rather, you know... <laughs> We, I wonder sometimes why we have them. So I would like to, um, as Councillor Darcy mentioned earlier, about this is a known area for migration of amphibians. And, um, and I would like to be able to uh, mention that it would cause um, a lack of biodiversity or um, less biodiversity um, rather than mitigate against the effects of the development. So I would like to use policies um, CC1 and CC2 but usually I ask for them and never get them. So um, thank you, Chairman. Thank you, uh, Councillor Wilson. You... I was just going to say that really looking at the whole proposal and uh, my colleagues' um, discussion on it, to me, it is a case of there are just too many loose ends that need tied up before we consider an application like this. They may be a path they may be able to uh, share the playground. They have to not put people in there until they've got the flood situation completely under control. It's, there's just too many loose ends. Yeah. Thank well, you, Chair. Well, Councillor Wilson, uh, welcome to planning. Um, uh, Councillor Demas. 
Uh, you, you can add a few things to Councillor uh, Townsend's. I, I am indeed, and actually um, Councillor Townsend has covered all my scribbled notes, which is good. But I also scribbled down about the lack of information, certainty that a sewage plan is viable um, to deal with sewage and wastewater. I, I, I think we should put that as a ground of refusal, that we have no certainty that it is actually achievable. So I would like to see that added as well. So it's very clear what our concerns are. Okay. Um, officers, Re Rebecca, Marie, um, are you... Oh, hang on, officers. Uh, Councillor Gosson. It's, it, it's to ask a question, really, because um, I think it is important. I, I understand the, the concerns of my colleagues and so on, but I think we... I just have a concern that if, if we go with a refusal... Um, in, in this sense, we, we pretty much nail our colours to the mast and, and that may just go to appeal or it may not. And that obviously isn't going to impact our decision. But what I'm hearing a number of colleagues saying is that there are just things they are still uncertain about. And if that is the case, then I think in the situation we're in, a deferral to seek some clarification on those issues might be better than a refusal. I just wanted to contribute that thought. Well... Councillor Costa, thank you for that, but uh, we have voted to uh, defer. No, no, the voted reason to I raised it was to see if it was possible. No. I just think okay. I, I, I would be beaten up by a few yeah. members here, I think. Probably happened anyway. Um, so, uh, officers, are you... Re yeah. Sorry, Councillor Gray, please. We're talking about reasons. Um, and yes. Certainly, I, I think that we should be asking for, and I, I need officers' support, opinions on this we should be asking for evidence on the practicalities of the access to the play area to go along with the lack of play area and why i'm saying that is if it's just a condition then they can seek to vary that condition and if that condition asks for something which is impossible they will get a release of that condition and by then it's too late um, and i think that the the other thing is the question that their site access and their, um, they should recognize that that site is accessed over a low dig road and they should have put something in their application on it. So it's the, the other areas of doubt, including the discharge into the culvert. Culvert's a very sensitive word in Dunsfold, mm. um, but I'm, I don't know whether that can be put in defensible ground. So I'm asking for help on that, but that would be right. nice. Well, officers, once again, we, we, we turn, turn you down and then ask you for help and advice on how you can uh, put our concerns or members' concerns into uh, uh, a good set of reasons for refusal. Rebecca, can you uh, guide us through these points? Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, just based around, obviously, this discussion um, that, that's taken place, I've just jotted down a, f a few sort of words, and if I just sort of read them out, obviously, they're very draft, and if I've missed a point, then um, obviously, please do let me know. But firstly, obviously, um, following on from the discussion about the impact on the character of the area, so looking at the countryside beyond the Greenbelt and AGLV, I would suggest something... Um, along the lines of the proposal by virtue of its quantum of development and positioning would have a harmful impact on the character of the site and surrounding area. It would fail to conserve the landscape character of the countryside beyond the Greenbelt and AGLV in conflict with um, RE1 and RE3. Then secondly, um, following on from discussions about the sort of the visual side of things and the buffer, um, something potentially on, along the lines of um, the proposal by virtue of its location would result in the loss of a buffer between existing development between the north and south of Dunsfold and would result in urbanisation of the locality and an associated visual harm, so in conflict with policy D1, TD1, D1 and D4. Um, then it sounds like there's a separate reason for refusal in terms of play area, so something along the lines of um, the proposal fails to provide an on-site play area and insufficient, insufficient evidence has been submitted to demonstrate um, a viable access to nearby play areas, uh, contrary to policy LRC1. There's also then the separate matter of um, sustainability. So again, I think that would need to be worded in a way that insufficient um, measures concerning sustainability um, being proposed 
and links then to CEC1 and CEC2 potentially. And then finally, again, going down the insufficient information route, um, insufficient information has been submitted to confirm that a viable sewage and wastewater um, system of drainage can be can be provided in accordance with the development. So I hope that that's covered everything, but if there are any matters outstanding, please let me know. Thank you, Chairman. Councillor Townsend has uh, a, a point, Rebecca. Sorry, Rebecca, I'd just like to confirm that that scoops up the fact that it is outside the settlement boundary, um, or whether that needs to be stated as a separate reason. Thank you. Rebecca. Thank you. Yes, I'm, I'm sure we can um, we can sort of put that in in the sort of the wording. Um, potentially, that was the sort of the second reason for refusal. So, when talking about the buffer, the urbanisation, we can then expressly refer to uh, its location outside of the settlement boundary. Thank you. Thanks, Rebecca. Okay, members. Councillor Gray. Just very quickly, if um, Rebecca could put in the gap the argument that there, that it is an amphibian highway. It's it's not just they live there, it's actually they come down off the fields through this area. So if we could build that in, I think it helps to, to support it. We have to have substantial in order to um, allow an inspector to sure. agree with our balance. Sure, Rebecca, um, um, to, to maintain uh, a pathway for the toads. I certainly didn't run over any when I went there on Monday. I don't think so. Yes, thank you, Chairman. I, I think we'll we'll need to be a little bit careful on sort of biodiversity and ecology grounds, given that Surrey Wildlife Trust obviously haven't raised an objection. Um, but notwithstanding that, perhaps we can come up with some sort of draft wording um, that refers to the sort of the amphibian highway. Um, and and you, will, you, will, you will settle that uh, with Councillor Gray and maybe Councillor Darcy too. Yes. Yes, I think it's probably best for us to think about how um, how sort of best and what the most appropriate wording would be in that in that regard. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, members, let's then move, if we can, to reviewing this uh, reason for refusal. Um, don't expect me to um, say exactly what the officers would do, but I know you've got it. Uh, so let me see those uh, who are in favour of refusal. And, and those in uh, and those against refusal. Thank you. And any abstentions? Right. Okay. So we've refused it. Good. Thank you, members. Okay, so um, we then, yeah, yeah, uh, members. Let's just uh, hold off for uh, five minutes now. Uh, if we if we can halt halt the um, transmission, Fiona. If anybody wants to get a glass of water, I think they're very welcome to it.
Members, are we uh, ready to carry on? Good, thank you. Okay, so um, moving on to um, item 8.2, uh, WA 2020-0322. This is land at Barnet Hill, Blackheath Lane in Warnish. Um, Rebecca or Marie, who is going to take us through this? Yes, thank you, Chair. It's Marie. Oh, thanks, Marie. Go ahead, please. So this is an application at land at Barnet Hill, Blackheath Lane in Wanash. It's for the erection of extensions and alterations following demolition of existing extension, landscaping, extension to car park, installation of generator and hard standing, and associated eternal, external works. Now there have been two update sheets. The first one is an amendment to the wording of some of the conditions to exclude works which have already taken place on site. And the second update sheet is relating to a paragraph regarding very special circumstances in the green belt. The location plan outlines the site in red. Move on to the next slide. Thank you. The site is to the south of Blackheath Lane. It comprises a grade two star listed building, which is currently used as a mixed used hotel, conference center and for functions. There are a number of ancillary buildings and the land level slope to the northeast, south and southeast. Ancient woodland surrounds the site. And there is a historic use by the Red Cross and it was acquired by Alexandra Hotels in 2016. Moving on to the aerial plan. This shows the location of the hotel in relation to Wanash. And you can see the areas of woodland and sloping land levels. The next slide shows the location of the public footpath. You can see it in pink there. It runs through the site adjacent to the converted stable building. Then we have the site photographs. This shows the main building to the front and rear. And then the next slide shows existing accommodation and converted stable building and courtyard. Next slide shows the converted stable block, and then sloping land levels. And at the bottom, the picture shows the public, public footpath. Moving on to the next photographs, this shows the wider site. 
including the generator plant area, site access and Blackheath Lane. The next slide shows the proposed site plan. So there are several elements to the proposal. The first main element is the erection of an extension and alterations to the main building, which would involve demolition of an existing extension and erection of a replacement extension, which would include accommodation, a kitchen and dining room. There would also be a spa extension shown on the right hand side of this plan, which would extend off the stable courtyard and it would be set over three floors into the natural slope of the land. The next slide shows the other development proposed. There will be an extension to the existing car park area to provide an increase of 17 parking spaces. And there would also be an area for the generator and plant, which would be enclosed with timber fencing. Both these elements of the proposal have already taken place. The next slide shows the proposed elevations of the main building. So the top drawing shows the existing extension, which is to be demolished. And then the other two black and white pictures show the proposed extension and dining room area in more detail. The next slide shows the proposed elevations of the spa building. It would be set over three floors and would be wood clad with areas of grass roof and PV panels to generate electricity to support the ventilation for the spa. It would appear single storey at ground floor level sloping with the natural land levels. And it would include areas such as treatment rooms, gym, therapy pool, sauna and steam room, and external seating areas with a garden cafe. And it would be open to hotel guests as well as day visitors. With this, there will be an associated increase in staff numbers. The next slide shows the gen generator area concealed with the fencing. And then matters for consideration are listed here. Officers consider that the extensions to the main building to be acceptable in greenbelt terms, visually acceptable and not to result in any other harm. No objection is raised regarding the proposed extension to the car parking area. The main element, the spa extension, is acknowledged to be of a large size and scale and of a design which may not appeal to everyone. In mathematical terms, it is considered a disproportionate addition and inappropriate development in the Greenbelt. However, officers consider that its delivery would enable the hotel to become a destination hotel, which would make it more attractive and result in associated tourism and economic development benefits. The revenue which could be generated by this addition would importantly help fund much needed improvements and ongoing maintenance of the main listed building and ancillary buildings on the site. Officers consider there to be very special circumstances to justify this element. No objection is raised with regard to the likely impact of residential amenity. And following review of additional information, the County Highway Authority has removed an initial objection and is now supportive, supportive of the application subject to conditions. Conditions are also recommended in relation to several other matters, including trees, drainage and ecology matters. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Marie. Uh, now, members, we have three speakers, uh, two public speakers on, on this tonight. Firstly, Mr. Tesla, Christopher Tesla, are, are you there? Hello. <clears throat> uh, uh, good. Mr. Tesla, you, you have four minutes. Please go ahead. I make the following comments, which I would request <clears throat> be appropriately considered an objection to this application. The spa. The architectural design of the spa complex is ugly, cuboid, 
completely out of keeping with the architecture of the existing buildings and all the buildings in the vicinity. The design incorporates flat roofs, a noisy outdoor plunge pool and cafe, solar panels, all of which are out of keeping with the green belt and the area. They're applying to build a 1,036 square meter spa. <clears throat> to put in context, the Tesco Express is about 200 square meters, so five times as big. A spa of this size will require external guests on top of residents to be financially viable and create more pressure on the single track road. 10 meters of ugly solar panels, which will set a precedent for others to do similar. The siting of the spa and the related generators to the east of the site places them most close to neighboring properties. Can they be located elsewhere? Separately, given the relative proximity of the building to other properties, are there noise restrictions on the generators and heat sources? What type of generators are they? Commercial air source heat pumps, such as those in commercial swimming pools and spas, are very noisy. I would suggest that it's inappropriate for other users and occupants of the countryside to be subjected to the noise of industry. The road. Blackheath Lane is a single track road with limited passing places. The previous permission to increase the conference capacity was granted on the basis of an argument that colleagues would travel together and only at certain times and not therefore overburden the lane. This new application would seem to invite materially more traffic at less certain times to a road that is ill-suited for additional traffic, especially when one considers its poor condition. When the previous planning was granted, a hotel minibus was stipulated to collect guests from the station and reduce traffic. This was of course never initiated, probably because guests like to travel separately. The hotel. The proposal seeks a new spa facility and other changes, which they claim would move the site away from a conference and events facility, so it becomes a luxury country house hotel. This is untrue. They are not replacing the event banqueting conferencing space. They are increasing it. They have applied to knock down small breakout rooms, which are too small to be used, into larger ones thus creating more commercially viable and customer useful event rooms. This will increase demand and not decrease demand as they like to claim. Doubtless, they prefer to serve events, weddings, rather than conferences, as this only increases footfall to the hotel. If they were moving away from an event-based facility, they'd have no need for the very large kitchen facility they've applied for. Creating a larger hotel with a significant increase in travel is inconsistent with the maintenance of the green belt and the AONB. The hotel claims it will employ 60 staff. <clears throat> this infers 400 guests on the basis of a staff ratio of one to six guests. In a 70 seater restaurant, which could be open all day and night with several sittings. Mr. Tesla, you, uh, you have a short uh, period of time left, 15 seconds. Thank Would you. you summarize, please? Yeah, restrictions on opening hours, music, and what can be served outdoor must be imposed. The use of fireworks, outdoor music being played, and barbecues should not be allowed. Um, you must also look at suds and them not using on this occasion the uh, public footpath, which they yeah, have. Thank, thank you, Mr. Tesla. Before. I'm afraid we have to uh, ask okay. you to draw to a halt on this. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Um, and now our second speaker, Mr. Brook, uh, Mr. Gary Brook, are you there? Um, hi, Chairman. Yes, um, I am there. Please go ahead. You have four minutes. Um, thank you, Chairman, for letting me speak this evening on behalf of the applicant, Alexander Hotels. Alexander Hotels is a family managed company which owns and operates five luxury hotels across the southeast. It bought this site in September 2016 and at that point undertook significant improvement works to the main building and ciliary buildings and gardens. These works were completed in September 2018. Following this and up until the start of the pandemic, the room occupancy rate stayed below 50%. This application seeks to continue the reposition of the hotel away from a model which is reliant on conferences to a luxury country house, hotel and spa. 
the new supply building would be located away from the main house and gardens, where the land is at a lower level and well enclosed by trees. In this setting, the timber clad in a building would mean that it would be both contextual and discreet. Alexander Hotels is keen to ensure that all its buildings have high sustainability credentials and the spa building would incorporate green roof, PV panels, air source heat pumps and rain water collection technology. These would all be secured by Condition 18. In terms of highways, while well, it is recognised that Blackheath Lane is very tight, the overall number of car trips is not forecast to materially increase, um, something that's been agreed with the um, Highways Authority. Although the number of jobs would increase, a small number of day guests would be allowed, the spa repositioning would mean that the typical visitor stay would likely increase from one, one night to three nights. Trips are also likely to be more dispersed throughout the day when compared to a conference use, when most guests would be expected to arrive at a similar time. We hope that you are able to support the officer's recommendation, which would allow further investment at this fine historic property and deliver benefits in terms of local tourism and jobs. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brook. And lastly, Mr. Crouch from Monash Parish Council. Uh, Chris Crouch, please. Yes, thank you. Um, Go ahead, Mr. Crouch. Four minutes. Thank you. Uh, you already seen our comments, which were summarised uh, in the officer's report. But there were a few points we wanted to emphasise and also make one request. The Parish Council um, continues to support the principle of this development. However, that support is conditional uh, on a number of, or a couple of main areas. First, we would like to see greater emphasis on reducing the environmental impact of the proposal. Uh, the hotel could be an exemplar for sustainable development. We note the officer's comment on sustainability, but would urge the applicant to do more. The second area of um, a, a condition is uh, where support is conditional is on the de development being sustainable in transport terms. The Parish Council continues to find much of the transport statement unconvincing. It appears at best heroic to expect a double, doubling of staff, greater occupancy, a destination dining venue, and a spa open to residents and non-residents to generate less trips than currently. The travel plan and proposed planning conditions are unlikely in our view, to provide significant mitigation. Support, supporting cycling is great, but it seems doubtful many staff or guests will risk the dangers of Barnet Lane, particularly at night, and take advantage of the facilities. Of course, we note that the County Highways Authority have drawn back um, from recommending refusal. However, we do feel that further work really needs to be done uh, to address the significant challenges uh, of what the Highway Authority uh, states is an unsustainable location of the site. However, if the committee are nonetheless minded to approve the application, our request is that the Parish Council be involved in the preparation and approval of any travel plan. We believe a transport management committee should be set up to include representatives of the applicant and the Parish Council, and would be grateful if that could be included as a condition. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Crouch. Members, if you're prepared to share your thoughts for the committee, that would be good. Uh, Councillor Goodridge. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and this application falls within my, my area. Can I say that, um, to start with, that one of the concerns of the, of the locals has been the spa with re 
particularly with regard to the position with the um, public footpath, but I accept that with proper screening, um, that can be mitigated. What, what I'm concerned about in particular, and to see how we can um, mitigate the problems, it relates to transport. Uh, and the County Council back in March 21 um, <clears throat> recommended, uh, raised an objection on the basis of access, visibility and sustainability. And um, of course, for anybody who knows where Barnet Hill is, it's at the top of a hill. It, it, it says it's Wanish, but it's actually, I think, marginally closer to Blackheath, but, but that's neither here nor there. But to get to it, you either have to go from Wanish up Blackheath Lane, and it, the, the roadway is described um, as a, uh, a narrow D-class road, single track with passing places, and, and a big bank either side and when you get to the front of the hotel you have a large stone walls retaining walls to keep um, obviously the uh, the land back from the road and the Surrey County Council in their infinite wisdom decided that this wasn't acceptable on sustainability grounds and the visibility flare. Surprise surprise um, two months later, three months later, they now think it's all right. And the, the major things that, that they have taken into account is the, um, the travel plan, which included in it providing 14 cycle spaces, covered cycle spaces to get to the hotel. Um, and facilities for cyclists to change and cyclists to store their cycle equipment. You have to be um, mad, I think, if you are going to seriously cycle from Wanish to Barnet Hill Hotel. You cannot cycle up that hill, it's far too steep, you'd have to push. The hotel guests, um, I'd be very surprised if, to get a suitcase on the back of their bike to, to get to the hotel. So presumably it's for people attending the spa or staff, but for staff, they're talking about sharing transport and uh, providing some sort of um, co combined travel to get there. So I, I am very concerned um, that the County Council um, highways department have decided that that it's all right after all the the other points is that we must have a travel plan consultation committee it was set up when the hotel became, was a conference center and has not really happened and the parish council quite rightly say that they want there to be a consultation committee and i would support that and want a condition to do so also, construction transport management plan needs to be looked into carefully. We had far too many big vehicles coming up there before. And, and also, I draw people's attention to the car parking. The car parking is going up, but it's still woefully too up, little. Um, and therefore, I think we do need to, to look at that as well. I'm very concerned, I, I appreciate that if the highway authorities say it's okay, we can't provide with highway reasons for refusal, mm -hmm. but at least let's be pretty on the, on the on, on speed on getting a travel plan consultation committee put in, um, as well as looking very closely at construction transport management plan for the construction of this building, because at the moment they have a site on the common which they used last time to, to have where, where all the lorries came and where the building materials were stored on the common. This was several years ago and it's still there. And I understand it's permitted development if they're going to do it. But after the work's been done, then the common must be returned to it as it was. Thank you, Councillor Goodridge. So you'd be looking for one or two extra 
conditions in there, which perhaps we can come back to. Uh, Councillor Townsend and uh, Councillor Reid. Thank you, Chairman. Um, just just a couple of things. Um, um, whilst um, you know the solar panels may not be the most attractive thing, I do welcome the the solar panels um, for the spa and also for the. Um, uh, I'm not sure whether they are ground source heat pumps or air source heat pumps. So it would be quite nice to have the clarification on that. Um, I am um, very familiar with the road and have been to the the hotel previously. Um, I do think that the the road. I think you know we'd be foolish to think that the road was not a a factor that needs to be taken into account and, and the transport and I would support Councillor Goodridge's um, request and the parish council's request for um, some kind of uh, group to be set up but also um, um, should and I haven't decided yet I'm going to listen to my colleagues but should, should we be minded to approve this then also um, in the construction phase, there could be considerable damage to the road um, going up to the hotel from construction vehicles. And I wonder if we could perhaps, um, after you know, bitter experience on other sites, whether we could request that a pre-survey and a post-survey is done um, on the highway and then um, any damage um, is repaired because um, you know, I think that there could be some damage to that road. Um, so uh, those are those are my queries at the moment. Thank you, Chairman. Thanks, Councillor Tanzan. So essentially, you're uh, supporting Councillor Goodridge's uh, construction management plan and uh, transport management plan grouped with Bonesh and ourselves. Okay. Um, I have uh, Councillor Reed next, but I think. Councillor Gosser, you did put your hand up ages ago, didn't you? You're very kind. Uh, Councillor Reid. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> I, I know um, a bit of the history of this hotel. Um, I know it quite well. Um, like a lot of properties in the Surrey Hills, um, this was built for the residence of Thomas Cook. So he'll probably be looking down on us at this very moment. Um, I support everything everyone else has said so far. Oh, by the way, the two bays that come out, one was for him and one was for his wife, just the back. <laughs> um, now, the Alexander Hotels, as a group, are spa hotels. So we are, I suppose if you don't agree with this, um, you know, it was on the cards that this sort of application might come in. Um, I support, support what everyone else has said so far. Um, it is one of those roads, which are the, the old drovers road, which came down off the Surrey Hills, um, hence the high banks. Um, I really think it would be viable to, because it's going to be a place where um, there would be employment for young people. Um, I applaud the green credentials and the sustainable um, building. And also, I think I want to say that I think it was one of the opposition speakers said something about um, it didn't like the design of the building. Well, new buildings have to be, and are, you know, we commend and support buildings that are completely different in the countryside or wherever to the um, old buildings that have been there for a very long time. So that's a prerequisite really of, of new development. Um, as to the footpath, because this, um, it is ancient woodland ground, but it has been replanted and, and that can happen in an ancient woodland. There can, because it's the ground that is the, <clears throat> the um, in effect, the ancient woodland, it is not the trees. So this has been replanted. Some of the trees are not as old as you would imagine in an ancient woodland. Um, and I am a walker and I support the people who would walk the footpath, but it, it isn't very easy to see when you are walking that path. Um, so, um, 
I don't think there should be an objection because of the footpath. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Reid. Uh, Councillor Coffin, Coffin. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, my, my general approach to, to this one is, is very much in, in support. I, I think this, uh, I, I do know the, the hotel quite well and, and, and the road network um, close to it. The, it significantly needs investment, and, and I think we should actually seek to welcome the investment that, that's going to be able to you know, keep the facility going over a longer period of time. It, it, I don't think it's going to survive without that, frankly. Um, so my presumption is, is very much in, in support of, of, of this. Yes, there are bits about it I don't like. Um, and I will say this to Councillor Reid, yeah, we maybe we do have to have modern buildings, but it doesn't mean we all have to like them. And I don't particularly like this 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 building, but, but that's my view and others may take a different view about it. But I don't think that's enough, particularly in terms of, of, of its setting and, and some of the greening that's going to be done to actually oppose it. The one thing that really does irk me considerably, however, is, 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 is the highways um, uh, dealing with, with, with all of this. It, it's just nonsensical to to believe that with a, a huge number of additional staff being taken on that isn't because they expect to have more customers and more people on the site and those people will arrive principally by car common sense tells us us give, given the setting and given where it is and and, and people's way way of life and and in that sense i i don't think that that and I agree with Councillor Goodridge on this, that the parking is adequate. And, and I certainly don't think that, that, that the road is, is really adequate. And to suggest, as I think I heard someone say somewhere along the line here, that they do not anticipate any additional uh, traffic just defies belief. Um, I, 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 so in that sense, I will support um, anybody who's got any ideas. Maybe it is this traffic management plan. Um, people might understand better than I do how we can do this, but we're always putting a real difficulty on these things when our highways people actually say that they're not going to object to it because that will put us in a real difficult position if we refuse, but it doesn't stop us being a little bit angry about it sometimes. Thanks. Thanks, Councillor. Um, uh, any more? Ah, right, Councillor Gale and Councillor Dinas. Down with Councillor Gale. I lost you now. Yeah. I'm trying to keep track of everybody here. Okay, Councillor Gale. Oh, and Councillor Henry. Right. Okay. And Councillor Gray. Right. Okay. Hang on. Bear with me just a minute. I'm, we're running out of numbers here. And okay, okay, so Councillor Gale. Thank you, Chair. Um, one thing that I picked up on from, I think it was the gentleman from the Parish Council, is outdoor activities because obviously they're going to ramp up what they're doing at the hotel, which is good. I think it brings employment to the area. Um, and as Councillor Costa said, it's probably going to protect the building in some way. Um, is there any restrictions we can put on to evening activities going on too long? Because you do get a lot of noise generated, outdoor events, fireworks, music. Um, I don't know if there's anything can be said about that in a condition or whatever. Okay, can we hold on on that? I'm, I'm sure um, Marie has got that noted, but let's move on to Councillor Dinas. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. I'll try and be brief and not cover points some people have already made. Um, I think the spa is ugly. Absolutely ugly. And if that's the best design they can do for such a beautiful building, um, I have attended conferences at that location. So whether I need to declare an interest, I have been there. Um, but it is just ugly. It does not fit in it at all. And I think, you know, if that's the best they can do, that's disappointing. Um, I was going to raise the point about the noise. Um, I, I think that is a huge one. Um, again, I'm, as always, disappointed in highways. Um, that's a dangerous road. I, I worry driving up it, let alone being on a push bike. Um, if I can avoid that road, I would. So, and, and, and at the end of the day, this is green belt. And this is why I'm upset about the design, you know, especially the spa bit. This is green belt. You know, I, I hear all the arguments about the economic development, which I absolutely agree with, but it's whether that outweighs the harm to a green belt. 
Um, and because of that, I won't vote for it. I will probably abstain, but I will listen to what my colleagues say. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Councillor Dennis. Uh, for my benefit, when you talk about noise, do you mean noise to other residents or, or to neighbours neighbors, if there are any? Um, but also people using the, the, the footpaths, et cetera, et cetera. So all, all residents, not just those who live close by. Thank you. Thank you. OK, so uh, thank you, Councillor uh, Henry and then Councillor Gray. Thank you, Chairman. I consider this a, a very interesting uh, application um, uh, to be put in some hospitality and updating facilities in our area, I think is, is commendable. There are a number of concerns. I, ca I can't see any special circumstances, so that, that needs to, to be teased out. I, I don't particularly like the, the, the design either. Uh, but I, I think uh, it, it's commendable that they, they actually want to do something useful with this building and uh, bringing this type of uh, business to, to our locality. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. And now, uh, lastly, Councillor Gray, please. Thank oh, you, and Councillor Darcy. So not Sorry. lastly, Councillor Gray. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Right. Um, it reminds me of Lie Hill and the discussion we had over, over that. I mean, the big question for me on these occasions is, what is the alternative use of the building? Do we wish the building to be maintained and do we wish to benefit from the investment that's in there? I, I'm pleased that um, Surrey Gardens were, were consulted. I think they provide a great service in, in, in Surrey. Um, they have expressed some concerns, but on balance, um, I don't think this, they say there's going to be substantial harm. Um, I may not like the uh, I may not like the spa extension, but if I remember, it's very similar to that which we had in Lie Hill. It basically went down a number of tiers. There were flat roofs, um, etc. And I noticed one of my councillors saying that the heritage people wants it to look completely different. You're not allowed. To make it look the same um, and beauty is that in the high of the beholder. I, I have a difficulty with this one uh, because of the highways and the highways are always the concerns and I recognise the impact it has on, on local residents on there. But I think I will make my mind up in the next two minutes. Thank you. Thanks Councillor. Councillor Darcy, lastly. Uh, uh, and members, put your thinking caps on. Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, as someone who lives in Bramley, um, I should explain this peculiar um, audio effect of living in that area. Because of these, there's several hills, you get sound bouncing around. So if you're in Bramley, you can hear pretty much anything that happens on top of those hills. So I would definitely say that we need to have noise restrictions in place, or you'll get an awful lot of very high rate Bramleyites. Uh, and I'm sure it's the same applies to Wanish as well, actually. Um, also, I wanted to comment on the um, climate change and sustainability again. It's quite, I'm pleased to see that they're talking about solar panels, even though they admit they're not very attractive, but uh, they serve a very useful purpose. However, I would have thought they would have included um, solar thermal because they're going to be gen needing to heat water. And that's a much more efficient way of heating water than than solar PV. Um, also, the, the heat pumps, why didn't they consider a ground source heat pump, for example, which is more effect, efficient than, a, than an air source and, and silent as opposed to the, the air one. Uh, so that's, I think they need to reconsider that. Um, the other thing I was going to say was about the biodiversity, which is just a little comment on the consultants they used. On the websites of their ecological consultants, it says, Get planning or your money back. We take complete ownership of your tree and ecology surveys so you can get planning permission fast. It doesn't strike me as particularly professional uh, or dispassionate or balanced or evidence-based. And I'm slightly concerned that Arbtech are not reputable ecological consultants and therefore their report should be treated with caution. Thank you. Um, we heard it first from you, Councillor. Um, right. Uh, 
Councillor Goodridge, yes, please. Can I just clarify the situation so far as the uh, travel plans? The officers have quite rightly put in condition six, which deals with the um, construction um, and environment and transport management plan for the building of this matter if we grant permission. Uh, and that does include uh, before and after construction condition surveys of the highway, mm -hmm. um, which is good. I, I, <clears throat> all I'm doing is urging officers to try and ensure the size of vehicles that are used for this development uh, on the basis that we grant it are not large because we have had vehicles up there that have blocked the road totally and then couldn't budge. Um, and then great difficulties were caused to neighbours. And I don't know whether that construction uh, plan can include where their uh, yard will be for materials, storage, and so on, because I would prefer it not to be on the common, the other side of the footpath, which is what they used last time. And I, I'm just asking officers whether we can... Um, um, direct where their permitted development for storage should be, rather than having to have it the other side of the footpath, which on one of the photographs, it showed very clearly where they'd used it last time because it's still covered in uh, materials and a fence and electricity and everything else on the common. Um, I'm told by officers that if you have a development, then, um, or permission and you want to um, construct what you've got planning permission for, then you get permitted development to have a yard to, to construct from, which, which is permitted development, but perhaps that could be clarified. But I would like to propose a new condition to set up a travel plan consultation committee, similar to the one um, which would involve the parish council, and others, the same sort of um, travel plan consultation committee that we had last time, which seemed to disappear and nothing much happened. So this time, I think there's a will to ensure that neighbors and the parish council uh, can meet together to ensure that we can minimize the problems and to hold the hotel to task when they say what they're going to do to mitigate the travel movements um, uh, and, and so on. I mean, they talk, Sari talk about the local public transport. There isn't any or hardly any. And with Arriva in, Arriva in problems, um, it's going to be even less. So you, you, you won't get a bus to this place, that's for sure. So um, and cycling links it talks about in their plan. As far as I'm aware, there aren't any cycling links. There's plenty of places to walk footpaths, but no cycling links. So I, I would like to propose a condition of a, of a travel plan consultation committee. I feel on balance that it should be granted because I, I, for the reasons we've talked about. It's, it's a, a heritage building. It's got to be kept going. It's, it's going to be an asset, but we must mitigate the problems that arise from it. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Marie, um, may I ask for your views on uh, these, the extra condition that Councillor Goodridge is suggesting and uh, how we might incorporate a uh, noise abatement society that has sprung up here? Thank you, Chair. Um, to be honest, I, I don't think um, the committee idea that's been proposed would really meet the condition tests um, in that it needs to be reasonable, necessary, directly related to, to the proposal, etc. Um, however, I do understand um, where the council is coming from, and perhaps we could add an informative in that regard. Um, also, in terms of noise, there's no objection from environmental health. And also, it's important to note that at the moment, there's no restrictions that we're aware of in terms of the use or hours of use, um, things like weddings can take place and conferences. So really there isn't a change of use that wouldn't be reasonable to restrict that now. Um, 
So yeah, so that's my my opinion, but I'm happy to add informatives for the applicant to work together with uh, residents and, and members if, if that would help. Okay, thank you, Marie. So the suggestion then, Councillor Goodridge, is that we have an informative on, on that. Uh, are you happy with that? Yeah, I don't know whether that's what we did for the um, previous application in 2009, I think it was. Um, if that's what they did last time, then we can't have it as a condition. I, I obviously have to take officers' advice. That's okay. what they're there for. But well, I didn't have the answer about in the track uh, construction uh, management plan about the compound problem. Marie, can, can we uh, add that extra point into uh, condition six? Is it about where they hold the stuff while they're doing it, not on the common? Yes, that would be acceptable to amend condition six to add something in about that. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Marie. Members, uh, that's... All right, Councillor Darcy. I'm just slightly puzzled because we just spent 20 minutes saying why we thought a transport plan was necessary. And then we've just been told that it isn't necessary. So that slightly confuses me. Aren't we the ones who decide whether it's necessary or not? I thought we're talking about a, a, an informative on yeah, uh, no. transport management. Yeah, but plan. we were told a condition could only be applied if it was necessary and we're saying it is necessary i mean i thought that was the whole point of this discussion hmm. well marie uh shall we sack councillor darcy or can you advise him better like is, is it necessary or are you looking more for an inf uh, for, for a, a specific condition councillor darcy uh, can you help us here, Marie, please? I think uh, some members are looking for a harder than informative. Sorry, I, I've lost track of exactly what's being asked. Um, this is about... Uh, the, uh, the travel plan committee. I, I think uh, Councillor Darcy is concerned that, uh, that we should have, we must have a traffic management plan as a condition rather than specifically around an informative on the setup of, of a group to manage it. I mean, both of which presumably are necessary. Condition seven relates to the travel plan. It requires an updated travel plan to be submitted within one month of the development being brought into use and then reviewed. So that's already in place? Yes. Right. Uh, excuse me, Marie. Can Sorry, Councillor Dinas. Sorry, if I heard that right, it's within one month of the it all being developed, like, which seems bizarre to me. I, I have to admit, I totally agree with my colleague that I would like to see this as a condition. It's you know it's the conditions that we feel appropriate and unnecessary. You know, we take in the advice that uh, Marie's given us, which we've you know I've listened to. But I feel a condition makes it enforceable. I have seen it as a condition in all fold for the Cranley Brick and Tile, where there was a liaison group set up by a condition, and it has been extremely successful because they know if they don't, it's a breach. So accepting that advice, I would actually support the original views of Councillor Goodridge and then Councillor Darcy. I'd be happy to support if it needs a second or a proposal that that is a condition not an informative. Okay, Marie, uh, I guess what we're putting to you is that we, we wish it to be hard and fast condition on the establishment of a traffic management plan prior to, say again. A travel plan consultation committee, yes? Right. Uh, Okay, what well, condition seven relates to a travel plan. I, I believe that one has already been submitted as part of the application, a draft one, until the um, development is brought into use. 
then they won't know 100% how that's going to work. So they have to then submit a an updated plan for us to approve. But there is already one proposed, which would be in place. Um, we could amend the wording of Condition 7, if that would help. Um, but I, personally, I think that is covered by that. And then with an informative about the travel plan committee, that would be sufficient. Um, I don't know whether our legal officer, Lewis, has got any views on that, um, but I, I think that would cover it. Okay, all right. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Goodridge on that point. Yes, I, I accept there will be an approved travel plan, but some input from a committee of locals, the parish council and so on, and reviewing it on a regular basis to see if the aspirations are kept is important. Uh, and, and therefore, yes, I accept when it comes to a travel plan, it'll be updated and changed and they've got a condition to do so. But um, to have this committee means that the applicant has got to consult on a regular basis and, and a two-way conversation with the parish council, with the local residents, and possibly the borough councillor as well, to, to ensure that we do the best we can to ensure that the transport um, arrangements do not cause chaos and unreasonableness for the rest of the users of that highway. Thank you, Councillor Goodridge. Marie, does that make, uh, is that clear to you? that we need to set up a travel management plan committee uh, to monitor the traffic management ongoing with Wanish Parish Council. Now, are we looking for an informative or a condition? Councillor Dina says condition. I think members who are speaking on this would prefer a condition. They want it to be hard and fast. Can, can we work that in, Marie? If if members really feel strongly about that, then we could amend condition seven to include that wording. Marie, thank you. I think uh, uh, I, I've held you up on that, and thank you for for getting us there. Um, in the end, members, uh, based on that amended condition number seven, um, let's move to uh, the vote um, recommendation is that uh, subject to conditions one to 22 and informatives one to 10, permission be granted. Uh, may I see those in favor? Okay, thank you. And those against and any abstentions? Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Marie. Thank you, Georgina. Thank you, members. Right, moving on now to, um, oh, to say that that has been passed, right? Thank you. Moving on now to uh, 8.3A3, WA 2020-0004, land at Canal Rushet to run common or something like that. Um, We have uh, uh, Kate, you're, go you're going to take us through this, are you? Yes, thank you, thank you Chair. We're just thank setting you. up the presentation. It'll just be a minute. Thank you. Hi, thank you very much, Chair. Um, this application is for the construction of a new canal um, and uh, an associated towpath and landscaping alongside the erection of a new um, agricultural um, accommodation bridge. Here we can see a location plan with the site outlined in red. Um, the, the main part of the site um, you can see there in the centre 
um, where, where the blue line is, um, the light blue line is indicated, is along the existing Downs Link um, public footpath. The site also includes a portion of the um, road on, uh, or rather a portion of land adjacent to Run Common Road, which you can see to the south there, where a new construction access is proposed. Um, there's also an area of land to the north of the main existing Downs Link, where um, a flood compensation area is proposed, which we'll go through in detail as we go through the presentation, um, and also an area where a new um, temporary reprovision of the Downs Link during construction works would be made. Um, I have some site photos here. The first two photos you can see here are of an existing um, bridge structure um, which accommodates the Downs Link at a, high, a slightly higher level. The area you can see to the ground there um, is an existing underpass which is utilised by the farm on the other side, which you can see in the left hand uh, photo, um, to access their land beyond. Um, the land that you can see within the photo to the bottom right um, is some of the land which would form the flood compensation area. And I have two photos here now of the, the Downs Link as you leave that area um, adjacent to the farm. Um, as you can see uh, in this section of the, uh, of the Downs Link, it is... Um, as existing a relatively narrow footpath with um, self-seeded trees to, um, to the sides. I would say this form is probably fairly typical of the existing Downs Link, um, although it does open out more uh, towards the Bushits Common Bridge End, um, which unfortunately I didn't have a photo of to show you. Um, so moving now to the proposed site plan, um, you can see here in blue the pr proposed canal cut, which would be um, 9.5 metres in width um, and I believe uh, around 650 metres in length um, between the existing bridge at Runcommon, Runcommon Road, which is to the south, so the, the bottom of the screen there, and the existing um, bridge at Rushet Common, which is to the north at the top of the screen there. Um, the, a new towpath would also be provided, which would be three metres um, in width over the vast majority of the length of the new canal, um, and would also be have a connecting route into the existing bridleway, um, which runs to the north of the application site, um, which I believe is 330. The, um, the proposal also includes um, a new accommodation bridge, which would in effect allow the existing farm, Rushit Farm, which you can see there roughly in the centre, um, to the south in the centre of the application mm -hmm. site, um, there would be an existing bridge over the canal to allow access to the agricultural land to the other side. So that would in effect um, reverse the existing situation where the, the footpath is above and the access um, to the farmland is below. Um, and you can just see here some typical sections. Um, obviously, the profiling which would take place would vary significantly depending um, on, on the lay of the land in, in that particular section, but this would be a typical section. So there would be the central canal area and then to the side, um, a towpath with a verge to either side. Um, and you can see on the, the little diagram to, to the bottom there, that it's been designed so as to be able to accommodate um, broad canal boats. And here you can see just a detail of the proposed accommodation bridge, um, which shows that they'd be looking to provide a minimum 3.4 metres headroom above the towpath. Um, directly under the bridge, so this, this um, single accommodation bridge um, for the agricultural access 
and under the existing bridges at Run Common and Rushit Common, um, it's proposed that there would be a slight narrowing of the towpath in those locations to 2.5 metres, um, but the majority of the towpath would be uh, three metres in width. And here we just have some details of the, um, the landscaping that the applicant is proposing. A significant benefit of the proposal is that it includes um, uh, significant areas of new planting, which is in line with the um, objectives of the applicant, the Way and Aaron Canal Trust, um, alongside the objective to restore the canal. Um, so they're proposing that um, a, a large number of new copses, um, including native trees, would be planted along either side of the um, of, of the proposed canal. Um, on the plan here, you can see al alongside the numbers, um, you can see that half of the the area shown would be in a. Um, are indicated in purple and half in blue. Um, that distinction is that the purple areas would be subject to um, what's been referred to as preemptive tree planting, i.e. the applicant intends to plant those areas well before commencing works in order to allow those trees to become established um, and to allow a, a, wildlife, a wildlife corridor to develop prior to works beginning and um, these copses would place the existing self-seeded trees um, which have a um, relatively low um, visual and wildlife value. Um, so here I've just got um, given uh, an indication of the proposed construction management and um, obviously with with the excavation works involved uh, and the fact that it's an existing, um, well utilised and important public right of way, um, the applicant has considered quite carefully how the construction could take place without causing um, disruption to those circumstances. So they've proposed, um, you can see at the, the bottom, uh, if you look at the, the pink line here being Run Common Road, here you can see um, adjacent to the existing bridleway 330 um, that they're proposing a new vehicular access, which would um, have a, a clearly, clearly defined distinction from the bridleway access, um, which would then allow access for the construction vehicles along the canal, which would then um, go right into the site to the bottom um, adjacent to Run Common Bridge, um, where they would have a turning area to allow access to the whole of the site during the construction phase. You can also see above the proposed canal, as shown here, um, there is a yellow line which loops round um, and, and comes out in effect um, from the sighting of the proposed canal just here and then back down here. This yellow line is a proposed um, alternative temporary route for the Downs Link during the construction phase, so as to allow um, access through the uh, adjacent to the application site throughout the construction phase. And the key matters for consideration are the impact of the proposal on the green belt, the impact on long distance routes, um, and specifically the designated Guildford to Cranley Sustainable Movement Corridor, the impact on um, the visual impact and landscape impacts on the AGLV of the design, the impact on residential amenity, the impact on biodiversity, highways impacts, trees and flooding. Um, and the recommendation is to approve subject to conditions. Um, members will have also seen that an update sheet has been prepared. Um, so if I may, I'll just, I appreciate um, you, you probably wouldn't have had an opportunity to look through this in detail. So I'll just um, take you through the, the sheet here. Um, the first matter is that we've received seven additional representations since the report was published. The additional matters um, raised in these, which weren't included within the, the original 
um, schedule in the report is that a request was put to officers by members of the public to defer the application because we have now received another application WA 2021-02003 which is for a further new stretch of canal to the north of the current application site. Um, there are also queries as to the in light of that new application, whether the hydrology report and the decision that the application shouldn't be subject to EIA um, were sound on that basis. Um, there was also queries around the Surrey Countryside Access Officer's comments, um, stating that the, the width should be a minimum of five metres. Um, there was a query in relation to reinstatement of the rail line and an objection from Godalming cycling campaign, um, which was submitted as a representation by the public route. Um, and finally, there were queries made regarding um, the whether the harm outweighs the benefits of the proposal and comments regarding the council's website and the speed of access to the plans and consultation periods. Um, in response to those comments, um, and I'll, I'll read out here what I've written, because um, it's, it, it's fairly important um, in terms of our, our response to the request to defer the application, which we received from um, two members of the public. <clears throat> so, um, Um, the fact that they, we have received a new application um, for a new stretch of canal um, in, in application 2021-02003 isn't considered to be a valid reason to defer the application. Um, the current application should be considered as a standalone application the, the new adjacent site for a further new stretch of canal is not considered to be a committed development in accordance with the EIA regula regulations and therefore is not required to be considered in terms of cumulative impact under the EIA regulations. Should committee to resolve to grant consent for WA 2020-0004, this development may be considered as, as a committed development in relation to the newer application, and officers would respond accordingly in relation to the termination of that application, um, which would also apply to the hydrology report, i.e. essentially that um, with the EIA regulations, an application at this stage wouldn't need to take into account an application at the stage of the newer application. But in a situation where consent is granted for this, then that may change the position in relation to the newer application and the information that's needed to support it. Um, a lot of queries were raised um, both in, within the additional representations and the original um, consultation responses regarding the water source and the flow rate along the canal. Um, and in response to that, I, I've effectively said in the update sheet that it's inherent, inherent within the current proposal that we don't have details of the water source or the water flow rate through the proposal and it's been considered by officers um, and the relevant parties such as the LLFA and the Environment Agency in, in that respect as a standalone application and found to be sound. Um, the, so a representation has stated that the um, countryside access officers said there needed to be a five meter width to the path but um that's the in practice the surrey county council rights of way officer has stated that they have no objection to the proposal and recommended various conditions um which didn't late relate to increasing the width of the um path um, and again, anything to do with the speed of the planning register wouldn't be a reason to extend the consultation period. 
Um, and then I just have a few clarifications regarding the details and um, the description um, of the development as it appears in the report refers to bridges, but this should in fact just be bridge because a only a single bridge is proposed with the existing bridges retained at Run Common and Rushit Common. Um, and the applicant has also stated that they um, are looking to plant trees prior to any um, consent being implemented in order to allow the new copses to develop. And as we saw in the presentation that the public right of way would be reprovided during the construction phase. And just a, a couple of updates finally in relation to recommended condition. Condition one, there's a plan number change. Um, in relation to condition 16, which is the landscaping condition, the wording of this has been amended to clarify that planting trees prior to starting works otherwise to allow them to become established isn't considered commencement of development. And finally, conditions 19 and 20 were recommended by the Highway Authority and required details in relation to the bridges. Um, but um, given that no um, there is no change, no proposal to change the bridges at Rushit, the bridges at Rushit and Run Common, it's proposed that those two conditions are deleted and replaced with a new um, a new condition requiring details of the um, the undercroft of those bridges and what would be positioned within them. Um, I won't read out the detailed wording, but that, that's the condition in essence. So the effect of that chair is that the number of conditions overall would be reduced by one. Um, and I think that is everything within the update. So thank you for the, your patience whilst I went through that and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kate. We have we have three uh, public speakers uh, um, first. Um, so, uh, Ian Wilkes, Mr. Wilkes, are you there? Can you hear me? Yep, that that's fine. You have four minutes, and please keep it to four minutes. Uh, yes. Good evening, sir. I'm the Ramblers Local Footpath Secretary for Bramley Parish. The officer's report is both flawed, and there are several matters which ought to have been properly laid before this committee that have been omitted. The officer's recommendation states, whilst it may prevent the Downs Link from being used for large scale sustainable transport infrastructure, trams or trains in future as part of the Guildford to Cranley sustainable transport corridor, no such scheme is planned at present or has been found to be viable in the past. But the current focus, sir, is on reducing car use and promoting commuting cycle routes, policy SP 1.8, is to encourage the provision of new and improved footpaths, bridleways and recreational cycleways. Surrey Countryside Access advised that a shared footpath, bridleway and recreational cycleway should be five metres wide and not be part of the towpath in order to maintain walker, cyclist and horse rider safety. There is no mention of this in the officer's report. A commuter's cycleway needs to be separate because of their speeds and the need for lack of obstacles, including parents with pushchairs, toddlers, infants, older people and dogs. A commuting cycleway itself needs to be three meters wide. It is both Waverley and Surrey policy to encourage commuters out of their cars. A commuter's cycleway would be precluded if there were a canal on the Downs Link. Again, no mention of this in the report. The Way and Aaron proposal would compress all these users onto the towpath itself and reduce their combined width from a required eight meters to between two and a half and three meters wide. The more recent planning application, WA 2021-0-2003, has now been submitted for an adjoining section of the canal from Berkeley Green. A failure to consider the two applications together would be a serious omission, because by dint of their separation, the applicant has avoided the need to produce a hydrology assessment that would consider the adequacy of water flow. All, of the, all the committee has are separate 
reports that deal with flood risk only. That is significant because the original canal company, which had constructed Batery Pond between Cranley and Oldford, Oldfold, as a reservoir for the canal, that was never a commercial success because of the difficulty even then of maintaining water levels that restricted traffic. This former reservoir is now in private ownership. The committee should require a study of whether the canal could be kept in flowing water before it reaches any decision. Should water flows be inadequate, then the landscape impact assessments would all turn negative. This is the elephant in the room. The canal has no water source. Two of the most significant objectors were those from Mr. and Mrs. Cookson at Whipley East Farm in Chamley Green and Adrian Elliott, who owns Whipley Manor Farm. Both are situated off Run Common Road, stretch down to and over Cranley Water, including the farmland on both sides of the Downs Link. The officer's report makes no specific reference to these two objectors, without whose consent the canal cannot be extended beyond Run Bridge. This Mr. Would mean, Wilkes, would you, would you summarise, please? You've got yes, 20 seconds. This would mean that Rushit and Runbridge section would never achieve access to flowing water from further up, upstream beyond Buckles Bridge. This would have very negative implications for the landscape and environmental assessments. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Wilkes. And now, uh, uh, second uh, speaker, Mr. Courtenidge, Gary Courtenidge. Are you there, sir? Hello, Mr. Chairman. Yes, I am here. Thank you. Thank you. Please go ahead. Four minutes, please. I don't intend to provide further description of the scheme, but I will attempt to address some comments which have been raised uh, here and in previous correspondence. Uh, first question, why are we proposing to restore along the original canal route and leaving the Downs Link alone? Much of the original route is now lost beneath farmland, private gardens and outbuildings. More particularly, restoration of the original route would require a new bridge at Run Common Road, which, due to the de-restricted speed limit, would require long approach embankments, possibly encroaching into the flood zone in the vicinity of the Cranley Waters Bridge. Routing the canal along the Downs Link Corridor through the existing masonry railway bridges provides a sustainable means of restoring this length of canal and which we believe will enhance the attractiveness of this corridor. What will be the status of the canal path, canal towpath? The Downs Link, which will function as the canal towpath, will remain as a designated bridleway running alongside the canal and will continue to form part of the National Cycle Network. Its importance as a sustainable transport corridor for walkers, cyclists and horse riders will therefore remain unchanged. Most of the existing corridor width comprises trees, scrub and vegetation, which is currently inaccessible and is therefore not available for bridleway use. The width of the actual usable bridleway path will be increased from the existing one to two metres to an overall width, including verges of five metres. The quality of the path will be commensurate with that of other long distance paths and will be considerably improved on that which currently exists. It will comprise a hard, porous surfacing suitable for horse riding and cyclists, laid to falls to enable water surface to drain to adjacent ditches or the canal. And just to clarify the question of width, uh, between the bridges, the Downslink Bridleway will have a width of three metres plus one metre verges, giving five metres, which is consistent with or wider than most other national bridleways. The question of a future rail uh, transport link, as mentioned by the previous speaker, at the outset of this project, the Canal Trust sought advice from Surrey County Council regarding the likely viability and feasibility of the rail link being reinstated. Surrey County Council pointed to a number of studies of this potential route, all of which concluded there would be substantial capital costs in new infrastructure and operations, but a relatively low patronage, meaning that the economic business case was very poor and the likelihood of the route being reinstated as an operational railway was minimal. In the meantime, the Downslink has become an established and popular recreational route, and particularly with the continuing growth in sales of electric bikes, is likely to see increased usage as a travel to work route. The introduction of the canal alongside the established right-of-way 
would materially enhance the attractiveness and ecological diversity of the route, provide a significant length of new surfacing, and give surety of long-term maintenance over this length of the Downs Link. The Trust considers that its proposal to reintroduce a canal alongside this section of the Downs Link is consistent with the original concept of this transport corridor between Guildford and Horsham, Mr. and is entirely Mr. feasible Mr. and achievable 15 minutes, 15 in seconds, the short sorry. term. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Cordish. Thank you for that. Sorry to uh, cut you off when you were already being cut, cutting yourself off. Um, and lastly, uh, Councillor Seaborn. Thank you, Chairman. As ward member, I, I don't plan to make any strong points either way on this application, but I would like to reinforce several of the points of concern raised by Bramley Parish Council and ask that members are happy that the points have been adequately addressed. So the first one is that the use of the Downs link should be maintained during construction. Uh, the officer report mentions temporary closure of the bridleway, but it doesn't, uh, the report doesn't comment on closure to pedestrians and cyclists. If there is to be any closure for any or all of the potential users, then there should be a plan to manage the closure in terms of advertising and specification of clear durations. Uh, so I'd ask members to make sure that this is adequately considered when they deliberate the, um, uh, the decision. Um, the previous speaker uh, actually probably answered my next, the next query that was raised, but uh, I'll just make sure that it's properly covered. I couldn't find any mention of the type of surfacing to be applied to the newly created right of way. That was stated, and if, if that's the answer, then uh, it's, it's uh, a good outcome. But Parish Council would certainly like to see a minimum, minimum acceptable standard um, to be conditioned to ensure that cyclists who use the Downs Link in large numbers are not consigned to ploughing through mud, which they are at the moment. And then thirdly, Bramley Parish Council is concerned about the pinch points at the bridges at either end of this stretch uh, where the footpath narrows. Uh, there are other places along the Downs Link where horse riders have to dismount, so that's less of an issue. Um, but there is concern about headroom and safety near water at these pinch points. So um, I think the report addresses it, but I, I just like members to be, be clear that, that they're happy that the uh, reports and the background material adequately address these pinch points. Um, while you'll need to determine this application on planning grounds, I thought it might be helpful for members of the committee to be aware of the view of, of some of the residents in Bramley. Uh, the progress of the restoration of the Way and Aaron Canal was the number one resident concern in deliberations over the Bramley neighbourhood plan, which is going to go to re referendum in November. Uh, in recognition of this, a survey of resident opinion about potential uses of the Downs Link Corridor through the village, and I stress through the village, was conducted in December 2017. Uh, so the, the issue was the use of the Downs Link through the village and not the overall principle of each of the potential alternatives for the Downs Link. The survey attracted nearly 500 responses and can thus be deemed a significant exercise. Two thirds of the respondents expressed strong support for no change in the use of the Downs Link as a pedestrian cycle and uh, equestrian route. And that seems to be what's happening here. We're, we're south of the village, so it's a slightly different issue, but um, the, uh, the applicants are proposing preservation of the pedestrian cycle and equestrian route. The subject of the reintroduction of the railway regularly com comes up. The level of enthusiasm for the rail, a rail link was questioned of residents. Just under half of the respondents were strongly against a rail link. Just over a quarter was strongly supportive. Support for the canal was a little less clear. Just over one third of re respondents were strongly against using the Downs link for a canal through the village, while less than 20% were strongly supportive. So I thought that might be some useful background information because these, these questions keep coming up. But beyond that, um, if, if the, the three points I raised earlier um, are satisfactorily answered in your minds, then um, I think Bramley Parish Council would be happy. Thank you, Chairman. Thank, thank you, Councillor Seaborn. Right, uh, so Councillor Townsend, Councillor Reid, Councillor Darcy. 
uh, Councillor Gale and Councillor Wilson. So uh, five speakers at this point. So uh, Councillor Townsend, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm extremely excited by this proposal to reopen the canal. Um, this part of it is only using one section of the Downs Link. It obviously doesn't use the Downs Link going on the extra section. It's only 600 metres of it. And going obviously through Bramley, it would go back to its original um, um, bed. Um, you know, the Wearnown Canal was opened in 1816, and it's part of our local heritage. It's part of the um, what was called the London's Route to the Sea. And this is putting heritage first in Cranley, and, it, and it's serious. It's about placemaking as well, and this will affect Cranley as well as Bramley um, and other areas along, along when the canal opens up. Um, you know, the reason um, that... Uh, that um, Cranny has had so much development recently has been just because it's on countryside beyond the green belt. And whilst Cranny remains probably at threat of development, this is one development which will give Cranley a sense of place and something exciting. It will bring real economic benefits to the area. It would be unique for the area. It would mark out Cranley and the villages as a tourist destination. It would also improve and protect the biodiversity along not only the canal, but part of the Downs Link as well. And it would definitely promote health and well-being. The Canal Trust have always made their plans extremely transparent for many years and have held public consultations in Cranley and have presented to the Parish Council on a number of occasions. This is a well-received aspiration in the village. Um, as you will note, except for a couple of, of the objections, they're not from Cranley at all, um, and um, or the, the, the very near area. And, and that, when this happens normally, we, we are rightly quite curious about the motivation of, of some of the objectors. But, but getting back to, to economic factors, as well as the tourism, these um, waterways can act as catalysts for regeneration and Indeed, the new plans for the Dunsfold Garden Village have always promoted the reopened canal, and it's a really significant feature, including a canal basin within the plans. And, you know, how will this impact if the canal is not reopened? You know, um, the canal would obviously lead to nowhere. Um, waterways encourage many small and medium sized enterprise and the jobs in the locality to support tourism and also um, extra jobs obviously to support tourism and the waterway infrastructure. And they can also actually be used as important telecommunication routes. This will add a vibrancy and a vitality in, to the area, encouraging walking and cycling. And I know the Canal Trust people, they're professional people, they're enthusiastic people, and they would definitely be prepared, I'm sure, to work alongside any interest groups on the equestrian side or cycling side as well. We know how important these green spaces are during the pandemic pandemic and none so more than canals. I mean, if you think of the canal in Godalming, how many people walk along it, how they enjoy that particular area, you know, people go paddle boarding along there. The canal gives something unique to Godalming and I think it could give something unique to other areas of, of the borough as well. And I, I know that people are talking about this sustainable um, trans, uh, travel corridor. Um, but it wasn't protected under Guildford's local plan, and it's not protected from Horsham either. Horsham are using it as a green corridor and as a walking and cycling route. Um, there have been developments built along areas of it right up to the boundaries within Cranley. You know, it was only a single gauge railway before. There was not any room to do anything else within it. I may say some other comments perhaps later as the conversation develops, but I'm really supportive of this. It's the one development that's come through that I feel will be really exciting for the area, will bring considerable benefits and for biodiversity as well. Thank you, Chairman, for allowing me to go on a bit. Thank you, Councillor Townsend. Yeah, it, to my mind, is exciting. We don't often do canals, do we? Um, Councillor Reid. I Reed. too support the Wearnown Canal and always have done. But what I want to, to talk about is the um, just putting a few um, spanners in the works, really. Um, there was a comment made in the papers about this being a narrow footpath. I just want to remind everyone that there was an up and a down line. And if you go back to that photograph, you will see it's the width of two railway lines up and down. Um, 
I just wanted to point that out. I, I don't object to the um, the way in Aaron Cannell developing, but I suppose I I really do not like the idea of the dam's link being altered, the path itself, and the um, the land either side of the what we saw just now as a narrow path. Um, it has been retained as a, for a very long time as a long distance um, transport corridor linking us to the West Sussex coast, I believe. And I, I would like to see some sort of development of that in the future. Um, I, I understand that in more urban areas such as Bramley, um, Councillor Seaborn, um, you live in Lindish Wood, so you you are in, uh, very near um, this footpath, the the footpath as it is. So you would have a, a specific interest in in perhaps not not developing uh, the, the transport link that I um, support. Um, I think you know talking about heritage it's not it's not just the heritage cancer uh, townsend of the canal which I support it's the heritage of the the actual transport link which was the old railway line so I, I, I wanted to everyone to know about that because I don't think it's been mentioned enough in these papers thank you thank you Councillor Councillor Darcy uh, thank you chairman <clears throat> Um, it seems to me there are, I should first off start by saying that I'm generally supportive of Way and Aaron Canal Trust. Um, but I think there are two fundamental issues. Um, the first one is whether the canal is compatible with a sustainable transport corridor for walkers, cyclists, and horse riders. Um, and the second is can the removal of any possibility of any future use of that land for uh, some other type of transport corridor, such as a rail, um, be justified. And I would point to retain policy M8, which has been in our uh, local plan part two, which is not yet in, in force, but is in the process of going through that. Um, we have a policy DM33, Downslink, Guildford to Cranley Corridor, the route of the former Guildford to Cranley railway line shown on the adopted policies map will be safeguarded as an important sustainable movement corridor. Development in safeguarded areas which would prejudice the future implementation of transport schemes will not be permitted. It seems to me clear that this does prejudice future transport schemes. I mean, there's no question that it does. So therefore, actually, we can't permit it. Simple as that. I'm sorry about that. I'm, and I wish that, that Wayne and Aaron had kept the original um, route because what they're doing here is they're, they're taking away a future possibility on the basis, I think, what we're being told is it will be an economic benefit. But of course, this will only be a benefit once they've actually created the canal. All they're talking about is a 650 meter long pond, essentially, which is in itself not gonna create anything other than an obstruction. I mean, it might be quite pretty, but from the biodiversity point of view, I'd like to draw your attention to the fact that although the proposal will improve to a certain extent uh, by planning, more planning, planting better trees and so on, the it serves currently as a wildlife corridor linking habitats and allows the movement of wildlife, including bats. A lot of trees are going to be removed, and that is going to impact on the bats. Um, there will be many trees will be cut down, and that's an immediate negative effect, as opposed to a long-term potentially positive effect. As regards the long term, there's little evidence that an amenity navigation used by motorized craft is compatible with rich biodiversity. I'm sorry to say this, but that's the evidence from the science. The Basingstoke Canal and the Montgomery Canal have both been restored and have taken a serious hit on their biodiversity as a result, because basically you can't have motorised craft going up and down and people fishing and things like this and expect your biodiversity to stay. It won't. So 
we, we can't fool ourselves. We can choose one or the other, but we can't have both. And I'm saying here, Wayne Aaron, build your canal, but don't build it on the downslink, please, because we need that for, for our future transport policy to address emissions and climate change. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Now, I, I do think that Kate has a few words that she'd like to uh, uh, say. Is that right? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I'd just like to come back in relation to the point around um, the local plan part two and reference to that, um, just to reiterate that that plan isn't referred to within the report because um, local plan part two does not at this stage form part of the development plan. Um, so in effect, the, the key guiding policy is policy um, eight um, of the um, retained policies from the 2002 plan. Um, and, and that policy, um, in, a ref in effect, within the, the supporting text, refers to the retention um, of, of this link as a sustainable character, um, corridor, basing it, in fact, largely on the importance of the route as a long distance walking corridor and, and specifically identifies within the policy the fact that um, at that point in time, as at this point in time, there had been no viable um, larger scale sustainable transport intervention that had come forward um, at that stage as a redevelopment option. So I just wanted to clarify those points. Um, and also in relation to the statement as to whether the route is suitable for walkers, cyclists and horse riders as proposed um, with the towpath, um, I would just reiterate that the Surrey access officers have um, reviewed the proposal, rather the Surrey Public Rights of Way officers have reviewed the proposal and found it to be acceptable in all those regards and the applicant has um, quite carefully designed it to meet those um, those various functions, including by, for example, including things within the proposal, such as horse passing places adjacent to the bridges. So because two horses wouldn't be able to pass side by side under the bridges, the applicants considered that and addressed it by ensuring that there's um, sufficient surface space for um, riders to rake. Uh, to wait if they come across another rider at the same time. So I just wanted to clarify those few matters. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Um, Councillor Gale. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm in total agreement with Councillor Darcy. Waverley's policy has always been to encourage an alternative transport method, and the Downs Link has been named. A, a long pond for recreation doesn't do this, especially one which I'm not sure we've actually established, does it have a water feed? The Downs Link has always been spoken about as an alternative to take the weight off the roads. But if we take this section out, we lose that forever. We cannot bring it back, it's gone. And I don't think we should do that. I do support the Way and Aaron Canal, and I think they do a wonderful job, but I don't think they should do it there. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Wilson and then Councillor Goodridge. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I think it is a sustainable form of transport. Their idea will actually uh, eventually take you from uh, the coast of West Sussex to London. If they reach Shalford, they're then on the, um, the way. And um, I think a form of transport that takes me away from a road, even if it's on holiday, and the benefits that will arise from more people using it, it'll keep some of our pubs alive, actually, among other things. It'll keep little businesses that sell things at the canal side, shops, groceries, what have you. I really do think that the benefits of them extending the canal when I look at what my children will have, far outweigh any of the um, other considerations. I really do. I will support it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Goodridge. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I, I share Councillor Townsend's sort of excitement of this uh, and, and the way in Aaron Canal generally. 
mention has been made about not um, if we grant permission, then the Downs Link can't be used, for example, in the future for a railway. Um, I'll just remind members that when we granted planning permission for Dunsfold Village, we looked at great detail about the possibility of a rail link. And apart from the economics of it, which didn't add up, um, the other thing we were advised at the time, and it won't be any better now, is that the two tunnels uh, at the south of Guildford Station are at maximum capacity. So no new train service could be introduced that will end up at Guildford because there isn't the capacity for the tunnels. So I think the chances of having a railway running between Guildford and Horsham via Cranley and this site is extremely unlikely. Thank you, Councillor. Of course, it's not before us now anyway. Um, no more speakers. Uh, Kate, would you just remind us about the... Uh, sorry, uh, Councillor Townsend. I would like to say a few bits more because I can appreciate what people are saying, but and, and I know you have to have looked into this really, really, you know, in great depth. And I have read the feasibility studies to my um, great distress, to be honest. And it wasn't a double track. It was a single track with double track passing places. And I have seen the old plans of the track um, and also as well as the viability studies. I think what what members have to understand is, is even if it was wide enough to put in a double track, there would not be enough room there to put in a double train track, a cycleway, a pedestrian route and a bridleway there. So, you know, if we want to protect the cycle routes, the sustainability and everything, we have to be realistic about the size of the Downs Link and also about the development. It's not just big houses in Lynn that are backing onto this it is small houses going up through Bramley. If you look at the map, you can see houses are built right up to it as well in Cranley, the Barclay Homes development. You can reach out from the Downs Link and touch one of the houses uh, and the other houses will be very near. We didn't complain about that. We didn't go on about that that time. Oh my goodness, we must protect this in case it needs a railway. The opportunity may have been there at one stage to reinstate a single line, but it has been lost. And one of the most important things for our villages, and really important, is buses and electric buses. That's what creates sustainable transport between the villages. Tram lines, train lines, whatever, exist on a single place. You have to get there. You have to drive there. You have to walk there. Usually you have to have very large car parks to accommodate people driving to a point which they get on another bit of transport to get to another point. Our rural bus services are the most important sustainable transport link that we could have. They pick people up near their homes. They go to all the villages in between. Shamley Green couldn't get to this. You know, they would be excluded. You'd have to walk for miles to get to it. You know, people in Rowling potentially couldn't get to it. You know, we have all the little villages in between. I very much want sustainable transport, but I recognise absolutely fully that sustainable buses are a possibility and something, you know, there's been studies done by uh, the, the CPRE about how badly we have invested in our, our local bus service. And whilst in the dream of things, you know, people think, oh, sustainable transport corridor sounds so lovely. It isn't feasible, it isn't deliverable. And what is deliverable and does maintain the bridle path, the cycle path, and, um, and also provides something new and exciting. And I take exception to Councillor Darcy saying about the, um, the biodiversity, because as much as cars and diesel engines are being phased out, diesel engines are being phased out on, on um, the um, boats as well. And so therefore we will have electric boats with electric, uh, um, with solar panels as well, going down these areas. The Way and Aaron Canal are, are planting on the outside. They won't start this for a while. And, and I think it will enhance biodiversity, but not only that, not only that, the most exciting thing is to have the canal back, which would create something unique. Anyone can have a transport. We have got one opportunity to have a canal, and I think we should grasp it with both hands and and cons you know and and have something new and new unique for for our areas, our villages. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, Councillor Reid, if you're very quick. 
I just want to say that we're not against the canal. I'm not against the canal, I support the canal. It's just that I do not want part of the dam's link to be inaccessible for the time that it's being developed or biodiversity uh, will, will just disappear. We won't have that. And this is the year. The I'm not supporting the train. I'm, I, I just wanted everyone to know what it was and you've taken the wrong, the wrong line. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Now, Kate, I, I'd just like you to remind us about the, uh, the joining together of conditions 19 and 20 or the removal of it and the replacement with, with one other because that's a change to the recommendation from what it was originally. Uh, yes, that's one uh, change, and there's also a recommended change to um, just one plan reference within the plan numbers right. condition, and just a li little addition to condition 16 as well. Thank you. Okay, members, um, let's put it to the vote. Let's see if it will float. Um, those members in favour of... Uh, uh, supporting this application, please raise your hands. Those against? And uh, any object, uh, abstentions? So, excellent. Well, thank you all very much. Um, oh, it's, it's not secret, but it's carried by one. Um, moving on now to uh, what I hope is the end stage. Thank you both very much. Um, item. Uh, nine on our agenda uh, moves into two applications uh, which are very closely well in fact they are almost the same and i'd like to take them together but there are there are two applications that uh, uh, we will um, still have to uh, decide um, they are wa 2021 0243 and WA 2021 uh, They're both at Derriborn uh, Cranley Road and Alex will take us through it. If you would. Thanks, Alex. Thank you, Chairman. Yes. So I will, what I've kind of trying on doing, Chairman, as you outlined correctly there, there's, there are two applications here at the same site. Um, hang on, Alex. Would it be possible to uh, have a two-minute break? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy. Alex, can you hold off for a bit? I'm sure I can hold off for two minutes, yep. That's very kind. Or, or maybe five.
So I went and got a cup and there was a little water machine. So it says from a water machine rather than a tap. Martin, you're rather on your own now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 After a while. Well, that doesn't be well. Um, it's got a case of plague. Okay, members, I think we're ready to uh, re restart. So if you would take your seats. Thank you, members. Uh, members, please. Thank you. Um, me members, please. Uh, Alex, can you please uh, resume or start again if you'd like. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, as I was just going to say, I will run through the presentation for the first of the two applications, and then perhaps if, if you would like to do that, we'll then do a very quick outline of the second application because it is, it is very similar. We can do that and then and then go from there. Uh, do you want to just point out that there's very little difference between these two? Yes, I will make I will make that clear as we go through. 
So this, this application is for the erection of a triple garage um, following, following the demolition of outbuildings at Derrysbourne Cranley Road in Wanersh. This slide shows the location plan. Uh, the site is accessed from the southeast uh, via a private road uh, that leads from the Cranley Road. Derrysbourne is located centrally within the plot, uh, set further back than Derryswood Gate, which is the immediately adjoining neighbour uh, and is also the only neighbour within 150 metres of the site. This slide shows the aerial view of, of, the, of the area. Um, Derrysbourne again located centrally as indicated by the arrow here and Derrysburg Gate can also be seen sort of towards the front of the site on the right hand side of the picture. And this slide shows some of the site photos. Uh, three of these photos uh, indicate the same outbuilding located at the very front of the site. Um, and also you can see the gates that have been erected on the front of the site in the sort of top left and bottom right photos. The top right photo shows another of the outbuildings, which is located at the back of the site behind the dwelling. And these are all to be removed as part of the application. Here's some further site photos showing um, additional outbuildings that are to be removed from the site. Uh, the top left photograph shows the second of the two outbuildings that are currently located behind the dwelling. Um, the other three are taken from between the dwelling and the footpath, which runs through the center of the site which I can point out when we get to the block plan on the next slide or the next two slides. Um, these, are, these photos are taken looking back towards the front of the site. The outbuilding shown in the right-hand photographs is located quite centrally um, and is to be, and it's going also to be removed. This is some further photos uh, looking back up towards the dwelling from the front of the site. There's been quite a bit of clearance on the site um, and some other works that are currently ongoing. This slide shows a proposed block plan. Uh, the main dwelling can be seen, as I say, located centrally here. And the proposed garage for this application is, is proposed to be sited here. Uh, the footpath, which I mentioned, runs directly through the middle of the site here. Uh, it's also worth noting that this also denotes the boundary of the A, O, and B. So this, the, so, and the, the A, O, and B is, includes the front half of the site. Uh, so this proposal includes a garage in the A, O, and B um, to the farther, where the dwelling is and to the top of the site, that is A, G, L, B, and not A, O, and B. This shows the proposed floor plans and elevations. Uh, the building would be a timber frame, two and a half bay garage with a tiled pitch roof. A garage would measure 4.3 metres to the ridge uh, and 7.8 metres wide. To have a set of timber doors on one of the bays um, and the other two, so the one and a half bays, would be open. <coughs> These are some of the existing plans and eleva uh, elevations of the outbuildings that I showed you the photographs of at the start. Um, so these are the three outbuildings at the front of the site and the one located more centrally. Uh, sorry, I do, do apologize, that's incorrect. These are the two at the rear of the site and the one in the middle. Those are the same plans. <laughs> so these are the key matters for consideration as the impact on the green belt of the proposal. Uh, the design impact on the visual amenity, the area of outstanding natural beauty and the AGLV, the impact on residential amenity, impact on the public right of way, upon trees and upon biodiversity. Uh, set out in the agenda report, the officer's recommendation is for approval. Uh, and before I move back, hand back to the chairman, I will just quickly show you the, the block plan for the second application, if that's okay, chairman, uh, just so we can understand the differences between the two schemes. And so this is the second scheme here with the garage located up near the dwelling. So it's exactly the same in all other aspects, just an, 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 a, a different sighting. Um, and on this scheme, on this page here, we've got the two block plans side by side. Um, so for comparison. Thank you, Chairman. Thanks very much. Uh, members, just to point out to you that uh, these are two separate applications. We can either ac accept them or reject them or one or the other. Uh, but the key thing, I, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, Alex, is that the new garage is the same size in both of these 
just a different location. Yes, that's correct. The, the application is entirely the, the same in all other aspects other than the siting. And apologies, Chairman, I actually had a, a couple of verbal updates to run through, which I, I forgot. If you don't mind, I'll just run through those now. Uh, these were a few verbal updates just following some queries that were raised following the committee site visit on Monday of this week. Uh, so first of all, there was a query about the width of the footpath. So further comments were sought from the County Council's right of way officer. Um, who advised that this footpath um, is recorded as being between six to ten feet wide, um, apart from where it then enters the site, <laughs> at which point it is only registered as a path, um, which would be expected to be one and a half metres wide. Um, and any reported disturbance or objection or, or obstruction to that would then would, could be enforced separately by Surrey County Council. Uh, there was also queries about um, trees, and because there was quite a, a prominent oak tree located on the site, uh, some comments from the council's tree officer uh, were, were received uh, whilst agreeing uh, that the erection of the garage um, in either location would not be harmful to this oak tree um, a pre-commencement condition has been recommended in addition to the conditions that are listed on the uh, the agenda report uh, to ensure that there's suitable protection during construction and demolition works um, as a result of that there's also further comments received from the AOMB advisor uh, who has confirmed that they have no concerns in terms of impact on the AOMB from either scheme. Uh, we also had um, requests for an additional and informative uh, to ensure that it was made clear that this the permission should permission be granted it only related to the, the garages and not any other works that are going on on site. Uh, and there was also a query about the existing outbuildings to the rear of the dwelling and whether or not they were taken into account uh, when permission was granted previously for an extension to the dwelling. I can confirm that that extension was considered to be appropriate Greenbelt development of its own right as a proportionate addition and the floor space that was within that outbuilding was not, it was not so it's not been like double counted for, for want of a better term. Thank you, Chairman. Thanks, Alex. Uh, Councillor Goodridge. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. These two are on my patch as well. Um, can I th thank Alex for his report? And also, um, various things arise here. Um, the very special circumstances. I mean, this used to be a, a modest former artist studio with only pedestrian access from the roadway up to it with garage, two little garages by the... Um, by the entrance. Um, can I say that the special circumstances lists the buildings that are to be demolished as part of it. I, um, despite the website being bad today, did look at both of the planning applications that have been granted. And WA 2020 oblique 1686, extension, uh, the footprint of that extension goes over the outbuilding that is to the back of the property on the, um, well, on the left-hand side as you looked at the map. And therefore, if, if that planning, so I'd ask the officers, I mean, if that planning permission is carried out, that uh, outbuilding's got to go anyway. Um, because it's in the way. Um, to that extent, it seems difficult that, that we can include it in the very special circumstances, that building, which is quite a big building at the back of the house. Um, the other permission under DW 2020-0049 misses just, I think, uh, the other building at the back. Um, and sandwiches it in, um, but so that I'd, I'd ask if that makes any difference to things. The, the other matter I wanted to raise is landscaping. There doesn't seem to be any landscaping conditions. And not only is the oak tree extremely important bit of um, landscaping because it blocks the view from the road of the house to a large extent, but it seems to me there should be some landscaping between the proposed triple garage, where, wherever we decide to put it or not, uh, and the public footpath, so that uh, walkers on the public footpath 
um, have some screening of the development that's being put in. Um, and therefore I would ask the planning officer whether it'd be appropriate to put in a landscaping condition to, uh, uh, for the officers to approve uh, a landscaping um, proposals before, they, um, before this app application is built out, if it's approved. Um, I mean, the, the daft thing is that the garage nearest the house um, is a, would be built over a access way that's already been built um, to the property, um, which would then block the other part of the access way beyond it. And, and um, I, I don't quite, quite see the logic of all that. So, <clears throat> And it might be said that, that it would be less visible, this, this garage, if it was lower down rather than near the house. And therefore, if, if I had a preference, uh, it would be uh, it, the, the one nearest the road. But um, we've got to look at both applications on their merits and decide whether they are acceptable or not. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Goodridge. If only planning was uh, uh, easy, I agree. Um, Councillor Reid and then Councillor Gale, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, and Councillor Costa. Every time I look at these, um, this area um, and these sort of plans, they seem to change. I don't know, buildings come and buildings go. Um, I'm not quite sure what I'm supposed to be looking at. It's different again tonight. Um, basically, I, doesn't it depend on where the garden line is and the curtilage of the garden. I'd like officers to tell me, looking at the plans, is the garden defined by the red line, please? Alex, would you uh, help Councillor Reid on that? Yes, so if it might be easiest if I put the plan back up on the screen. <laughs> So the garden currently um, would is is, that, is considered to be everything, or the, so the residential curtilage of the of the scheme is currently everything from pretty much where the back of the house is, this bit here forward. There is currently an application in um, a certificate of lawfulness application to confirm the use of the the sort of the area, the square part of the land to the back of the site to be considered as residential curtilage. That is currently in with us and is live at, at present. Um, but yeah, so for the, for the lawful purposes of the land at present, we would say it is from the from the back of the site forward. Hope that clarifies. So that. I'm right in thinking that the two applications we're looking at tonight are within the curtilage of the garden that has permission. That's correct. Yes. Because I saw the the previous um, plan, and I know this area, um, had a building parallel with the red line across the back. I don't know what's happened to that building. I really don't. Thanks, Councillor Reid. Um, Councillor Gale, and then <laughs> Councillor Cosser, and then Councillor Dina. So Councillor Gale. Thank you, Chairman. Um, just looking at the layout of everything, there's a public footpath going through the centre. So in just layman's terms, surely you keep the garage and any vehicle movements um, one side of it, otherwise it's going to keep driving over a public footpath and that's obviously a danger. So um, I would have thought having the nearest the entrance would probably be the option. Thank you. Um, Councillor Costa and then Councillor Dinas. Uh, thank you, Chair. And I I have to say, I found this one the more confusing site visits I've ever been on. There's a, there's a whole miscellany of development and tarmac put down and so on for no obvious purpose. And I can't work out what the grand scheme of things actually is, but that's not desperately relevant, I suppose, to our consideration this evening. One thing I would like to actually clarify is, in, in a sense, it seems what we've been asked to do is say, well, we, we need very special circumstances here. And actually, there's not a lot of difference between what's being removed and, and what is now proposed. And increasingly, I'm getting a picture which suggests that perhaps there is quite a lot of difference. One of the so-called five buildings that we, is, is intended to replace 
case is is effectively largely gone. But Councillor Goodridge um, has drawn our attention to the fact, and I think we talked about this potential when we were on site that that if this 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 planning permission were given, it would have to do uh, would were built out. It would have to take that building down anyway. And I'm also beginning to understand that the other one that's pretty adjacent to it probably is not going to be sustained. Paul, once once the other building is is built, I, I'm not sure what to make of that. But I would like perhaps a further comment on or, you know from the officers in the light of what Councillor Goodridge has said in the comments I've just made as to to whether really you know there is the comparison that's perhaps suggested here that there's not a lot of difference in in in, in scale between between the two because it does seem to me realistically there actually probably is and whether that should change our minds. I'm not sure, but I welcome a further officer comment. Okay, let's hold back uh, uh, until Councillor Dinas has spoken. Councillor Dinas. Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> I think I need to commend Councillor Goodridge for his perseverance in uh, getting on the planning portal and succeeding. So I think that deserves mention uh, itself. T to me, the, the, the real big issue, this is Greenbelt. So, you know, Greenbelt is very special circumstances. And when I read the report, it sort of says there's a marked improvement in visual appearance. Okay, great. Well, I don't think that's very special personally. Um, and it makes it more secure. Well, <laughs> that's not very special either. Um, I just can't see how this fits into very special circumstances. You know, how many planning meetings have we had where we've had this debate about green belt and special circumstances or very special circumstances? And actually this one probably is least justification and, and most of the others. Um, you know, Councillor Goodrich is right. It's take out the bit of the building that's already got to come out anyway. There's not a lot of removal on this one. It's quite high, 4.3 metres in height. Um, I'm just not convinced in any way, shape or form, this fits in very special circumstances. And we either comply with that as a guidance, which is a policy, or we ignore it. So I'm not convinced, but I'll listen to what my colleagues say. Thanks, Councillor. And the uh, last speaker I have is Councillor Townsend. Thank you, Chairman. Um, just a couple of things from the site visit, and, and it was re really helpful to see the uh, building layouts and, and all the other outbuildings that are um, proposed to be demolished um, or have been demolished. Um, one of the things we did mention on the site visit was the um, surface, and I don't know whether you covered that, um, Alex, in your presentation, but the surface on the actual um, footpath as it crosses over what appears to now be a driveway. Um, I am sort of... Um, uh, listening to um, Councillor Gale about crossing the footpath all the time with the car, um, you know, it is, I think, quite important. However, the, the thing that does concern me is this is a very dark area. And my concerns are that if the garage is put too far away from the house, that there will be a lot of additional lighting required in order to light the path from the garage. It's quite a way, to be honest, and up a very dark dark pathway to lighting all the way up across then the um, footpath as well at which it would be required um so um I, you know I, I will obviously listen to what other people have to say but that that is a concern for me um on this one and um and whilst I appreciate that um the special circumstances that are being proposed are to do with the you know the the knocking down of all of the outbuildings which together create enough footprint to put this garage in um it is in a quite a prominent area when you look across from the um the actual footpath wherever this is sited this garage will be will be quite visible and i do support the extra screening um you know that councillor goodridge mentioned because um otherwise it does introduce a built form into what is a very rural, um, actually, landscape at the moment. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor. Um, Alex, have you? Can you uh, pull together all those questions to you succinctly? I'm sure you can. Yes, I'll do my best. 
So I think I'll, I'll just go back to, um, I believe it was Councillor Cossa who raised a question or comment about very special circumstances. Um, and also Councillor Dean has sort of followed that up. Um, yes, as we have told you in, in many meetings, the bar, the bar is very special circumstances. Um, in this case, we do believe very special circumstances exist. Uh, there's also the comments been made about whether or not one of the buildings has already been demolished. Um, it, from the site visit, we saw that it it's pretty much has been demolished. The the argument that was put forward in the in the report uh, includes, I think, it actually gives a figure of of that with and without that building. If you include that building, there is quite a substantial reduction in floor space across the site. Um, even without that building, there is still a reduction in floor space and floor area. Um, so, and, and we believe it would be a visual improvement containing containing that on the, on the site from across it. Um, so, it would be a, would be beneficial to the openness of the green belts. Also, providing secure storage, which you know for, for the which is something that would be reasonable uh, for residential occupiers on the site, which is again something we have considered to be very special circumstances in the past. Um, moving on to some of the comments from Councillor Townsend to do with the servicing of the footpath. I do believe that there are potentially enforcement investigations or ongoing on the site, but it's you know, the, the nature of which is, is not relevant to the, to the determination of this application. Um, any, and I think it's sort of touched on the impact on the footpath and any, any impact on the footpath by way of reducing the width or changing the surface to something that would not be acceptable would be something that would have to be dealt with separately by Surrey County Council um, and shouldn't pre or impact the determination of this application. Um, dark areas and the, and the, and the lighting, if it was deemed strictly necessary, I'm sure, you know, we, we could potentially look at the wording of, of a condition to control lighting. Similarly with screening, which has also been mentioned previously, I think by Councillor Goodridge. Uh, personally, I, I'm, I'm not, I personally am not sure if that is necessary. If members felt strongly that it was necessary, then we could look to, again, word a condition to, to potentially get some, you know, a landscaping scheme submitted. Uh, but yes, I hope, hope that covers most of the points raised. Do you say if there are any more? I think Councillor Townsend may have one. <laughs> it wasn't just... It, sorry, sorry. Um, it was, uh, with regard to the buildings, I know that when we went there and we, we spoke about it, uh, we wondered, uh, um, and I think you, you said you, would, you might be able to check on this one, whether or not any double counting had taken place on the buildings, especially that um, Councillor Reid mentioned towards the back of the property there. Thank you. Uh, yes, sorry, I, I may have kind of whizzed over that in my update, but yes, we, I did look into that. And I also take the point made by Councillor Goodridge that it, it just seemed logical that there's an extension pro you know, proposed that, that would require the removal of that building. It wasn't double counted, so that application was considered on its own merits and was deemed to be acceptable in Greenbelt because it was a proportionate addition to the dwelling. It, it, it is it obviously it's there. We know that it would be required to be removed for that extension. At the moment, it's not being, so it is still there, and so it does still carry weight in this application, <laughs> as you probably may have expected me to say. Um, but yeah, I, I understand that it's it is it doesn't quite make sense potentially logically, as you said. But yeah, in terms of you know the determination of this application, it is there, and we have to take that into consideration and give that weight. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. I didn't understand that either, but um, thank you. So it seems to me, members, that uh, uh, some of us uh, are recommending. Uh, uh, some screening on this new build. Um, um, uh, is that the main one, do we think? Councillor Goodridge, you are in favour of that? Yes, well, I think what one should do is, is make both the applications as acceptable as we can by putting in a condition for screening. And then we've got to decide, having put that in, whether it's acceptable at all. Um, that's, so, I mean, it, it, that seems to me the logical yeah, that's right, way around of doing it. Yeah. And therefore, I would urge that we do, if, if the committee agrees, put in a, a landscaping, particularly to, to landscape the um, proposed garages from the public right of way. There has been a lot of uh, greenery, undergrowth and small trees that have already gone. Uh, and I think we need to replace it with some tasteful landscaping. Uh, so, Alex, I'd, I'd like us to uh, add that condition in and then I think we should bring it to the vote. We should vote separately on each of these applications because they're individual applications. So Alex, you okay to add that condition or? In 
Yes, I, I've got some suggested wording um, which I can run through briefly. Please, if you would. So I'd, I would recommend that we would go for a prior to the first occupation of the garage hereby permitted, a detailed landscaping scheme should be submitted to and approved by the local planning authority in writing. Uh, continues then to say the landscaping scheme shall be carried out strictly in accordance with the agreed details and be carried out within the first planting season after occupation. Um, and then the, the landscaping should be maintained to the, for the local planning authority's satisfaction for a period of five years um, after planting maintenance, including replacement of any trees, shrubs that die, sort of to follow the standard wording of landscaping conditions, if that's deemed appropriate. Thanks, Alex. Well, I, I'd like us to move uh, one of these to the vote. Oh, Okay, Councillor Townsend. I wouldn't mind something about the lighting, if at all possible, yeah. <laughs> Alex. And also whether or not we, we could say native species as well, because obviously otherwise it could be anything. <laughs> I mean, I agree with you about native species, but surely lighting, Councillor Townsend, is up to the owner to decide how they want to deal with it. Alex? Yes, as, as Councillor Darcy is just about to point out there, I think there is a, a recommended condition to do with um, any external artificial lighting complying with recommendations um, in an ecological perspective. If you wanted to add something additionally to that, we, we could. If you're happy with that, we can go with that. Thanks, Alex. Okay. Yeah, if you add those two. So just from my point of view, remind me if we are going to uh, vote on WA 2021 0243, that's 9.1 B1 here. Is it the one on the left or the one on the right of the picture you've just, of that one? Just so we know we're, that we're voting on the right one. So 0249, item B2 is closest to the house. Okay. And 0243 is further from the house. Right. Okay, so members, we're voting on 0243 further from the House. Uh, may I see those in favour of granting approval? Right, and those against? Um, and any abstentions? No. Okay. Not carried. Okay. And if we go to the second one, which is, Alex, remind me, further or nearer? Right. Okay. Those in favor? Okay. And, and those against? And any abstentions? Sorry, was I too quick? That one's passed. Okay, so 0243 is not passed and 0249 is passed. Now, let's go back to 0243, thank you. Um, we need some good reasons why we don't like the one further from the house. Any suggestions? Uh, Councillor Wilson. I would suggest it's um, putting buildings either side of the path and it um, would actually impinge on the people's enjoyment of the footpath because you've got a block on either side as opposed to two together. Yeah. Well, it's either one or the other, that's that's true. Any any other suggestions, Councillor Gale? Alex? No. Alex, um, I'm sorry, sorry yes, to, you, you've, you're recommending to grant permission for the one that is in the OMB. Yes. Yep. So uh, uh, the one that's nearer the house, the one that's nearer the house is not in AONB. Oh, members, members. Um, we have 
voted. Let's just confirm. So, uh, WA 2021-0243, you have uh, turned down. And that one, Alex, sorry. Is, is, yeah, apologies. So the, the first application, 0243, item B1. Can you put it on the screen? Sorry, yes, I can. Yeah, I believe that I may have got that the wrong way around there. Oops. Chair, uh, members, hold on, Chair, Alex, could, uh, could we actually just state that having given permission for one three-car garage, we thought it was over the top to give permission for the, another one? Uh, I don't think we can do that, Councillor Wilson. Sorry. Alex, I'm sorry, you'll have to help us out here. That's uh, right. Make sure, I mean, I'm afraid we may have voted for the wrong one. Exactly what we do in that condition, I in that position, I'm not terribly sure. So, the, yeah, the first application, 0243. Yes. That proposed the garage in this location towards the front of the site. And that's the one we turned down, and that's the one that's in uh, AONB. That is the one that, that is within the AONB, yes. Right. And so the one that uh, members have uh, agreed to is the one nearer the house, which is not in AONB. I think that's a reasonable... Uh, uh, solution. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you very much. Well done, members. And we're getting close to bedtime. Um, some would say it's gone past. Um, so the last one uh, is uh, item uh, 9.3. Um, this has been brought back to committee from a deferral, WA 2020-1186, um, so, use of land. Sorry, Chairman. To, to, can I just confirm the, the the reasons for refusal that we were, that we've that we're going to go on? I think I don't know if we voted on a reason for refusal. I just need to make sure we've got those down for the for zero two four three. I correct me, members, if I'm wrong, but it was we didn't like it being in AONB. <coughs> oh. And its impact on the. Wasn't it Councillor Gale actually saying that the access would have to compromise the footpath by driving across it? Uh, they, no. Alex, I think I'm going to throw myself entirely on your mercy. Um, what uh, uh, would you find to be more acceptable than just not driving over a footpath? Uh, well, we, we can certainly go with the, the landscape impact reasons for refusal in terms of harm the, on the A and B from the, the other application. Um, in terms of an, a reason for refusal based on the impact on the footpath, I might have to defer to, That's a bit weak, to Marie if she's able to sort of a, a give any advice on that, but I'm not sure exactly what policy we'd be able to refuse on that one. Um, are you, uh, would you be happy uh, just on the AONB issue alone? I, th I think Marie is waiting to say something, actually, Chairman. All right, Marie, please help us out. Chair, <clears throat> Chair thank you, sir. I just have my hand up. Um, yeah, just to say, I think you need to resolve to refuse and vote on the reason. Um, in terms of the AM, AOMB and landscape, I agree with Alex that that would be reasonable. However, um, I'm not sure we could really justify impact on the footpath as a reason for refusal. Okay, members, so I, we, we go... I think we've got the right one. Okay, uh, Councillor Goodridge. Yeah, I mean, I would have put in, uh, I mean, I voted against both and because I didn't think very special reasons had been made out. Um, and therefore, I'm not quite sure we can put uh, very special reasons uh, not made out on one and made out on the other. That's the practical problem that we now have, having voted differently on both applications. 
Thank you. Councillor Townsend, it's all getting a little but late I, now. I don't, so it is getting very late. And, um, uh, but the special circumstances don't have to exist in the AGLV, do they? So the one that we have chosen is in AGLV, so special circumstances don't have to exist. Well, is, is that correct? I'm Alex? looking for, for help here, whereas the other one is in the AONB, where special circumstances have to exist. That is my understanding. Alex? Yeah. Members, please. Alex? Yeah, sorry, just to confirm, yeah, the very special circumstances argument is a green belt test okay. rather than AONB, AGLV. But yeah, so both, both garages are in the green belt. Right. Oh. Well... <sighs> Um, yes. Can I just stress what Councillor Good? No, I think it's just quite serious. We don't want to be made to look idiotic on this, frankly. Uh, certainly, the reason I voted against both um, was 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 effectively because I did not consider, on balance, that there were very special circumstances. Now, if you take that view, it it, it seems to me it's very difficult to say that, that that one is acceptable and the other one isn't. And how you make a case. For, for the one you've rejected on those grounds, frankly, I don't know. And I don't, and I think we have to listen very carefully to, to what Marie was telling us about that. And I don't know whether, whether you feel it could be reconsidered or watch out. I don't know what the process is, but I'm really concerned that we have got no significant or proper reasons for turning that one down. Well, Councillor Gosser, we have, uh, and not reasons, but we have done it uh, and we can't go back on it. Councillor Gray. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think this, from my point of view, and I, I did vote for one and against the other, is that for reasons of association with the, with the original building, we have the AONB, uh, the, the one that was furthest away, I, I felt that um, it's isolated. Um, perhaps even thinking then perhaps that could be converted into another use and then come an application for another garage. I just feel happier with the garage being associated with the house. You then reduce the need for ancillary lighting. You reduce uh, the impact on the total area and it becomes part of the, the main house mm. and the immediate curtilage. I don't know whether that can help us, um, but that certainly with the two reasons you have my vote. Um, Alex, uh, I'm sorry to put this on to you, uh, and Marie, if you can help out, but I think we, uh, that's the only reasons that we can uh, succinctly put. Alex, I hope you're not going to tell us off. Sorry for the delay. On it. We're having a, a conference with our colleagues. We've not, we've not made it well. easy for um, you. I think it might be the case that we have to treat both applications the same in terms of the green belt assessment here because of the very special circumstances argument. Um, so if we if we're going, we, I'm not sure we're going to be able to find one acceptable, one not. Um, unless Marie's got anything to add on that. Marie, I agree. I, I think it would be. Um inconsistent to say that there's special circumstances for one and not the other. But I do think the harm to the AOMB and openness of the landscape would be reasonable because it is further from, from the existing dwelling. Okay. Alex, can we go, go with that, please? Because I'm sure members would uh, accept anything at this stage. No, not anything at this stage, but uh, accept any straw, perhaps. Uh, yes, so if you if you want to proceed on a with a, with a reason for refusal on landscape and AOMB impacts, uh, got some wording that we could use for that. Thank you. To proceed on that basis, because so we have voted. Thank you, members. Uh, From I, a tiny I, point of clarity, and I a really really tiny point, is there something about development within the AONB and percentage increase? Is there anything from that? There isn't. No. no, I don't think so. A and Can't B use has, that in this. Okay, yeah. thank you. <laughs> uh, now, members, we're getting very close to um, um, the witching hour. Fiona, uh, do we have to make a decision as to whether or not to deal with the last item or? Um, 
yes, uh, we can. Uh, the committee can um, decide to either go until ten thirty or until completion of the um, uh, the agenda. Hopefully, both of those could be done before ten thirty. Um, it would be. Uh, could, could we actually just have a resolution on, on that um, uh, decision to, to refuse for, for that AOMB grounds, just for completeness, yes. please? Alex, what, what are your reasons? What are, what are our reasons for deferring, uh, re refusing the uh, first application? Thank you, Chairman. If you want to, want to go with uh, landscape and A and B, I would suggest the wording of the proposal by way of its bulk massing, siting, and appearance would fail to respect the character of the surrounding landscape, including A and B. Uh, the proposal would therefore conflict with policies TD1 and RE3 of the local plan uh, 2018 part one and retain policies D1 and D4 of the local plan 2002. Thank you. Uh, members, are you, uh, just to confirm, you are happy with that reason? All, all agreed, right. Sorry, uh, Councillor Gray, you are? Yes, that's right, okay. Members, those in favor of Alex Fine words, will you please raise your hand? Oh, sorry. And those, I'm uh, oh, sorry, are you counted yet? And those against? And any abstentions? I think that's carried. So carried. Thank you, members. Now, um, I'll make a motion to, uh, to ask if uh, councillors are willing to carry on till 10.30 to deal with the last uh, item on that. Those in favour of carrying on till 10.30? Yeah. Yes, I agree. All right. Thank Can you. I just make a point. I think, you know, I accept that we go on to 10.30, about be four and a half hours. I think these agendas are far too long um, to give it the justification that the public deserve and also for people's own health and their well-being sat in a meeting for so long. I just think it's, it's ridiculous. It's most meetings we are now struggling to get the agenda complete. And I don't think that's fair on the public um, to do it do just justice. Councillor Dennis, I agree. Yeah, Councillor Gray. Mr Chairman, um, I don't know whether you're intending to do a vote, but I certainly would be in favour of closing the meeting now and leaving this one. We've got to give it fair time. It's not that easy. And I think we should defer it. OK, uh, I defer the next application. Yeah, OK. Well, I am... Um, we have agreed to go on uh, past 10 o'clock. We can still move straight to this application. And if there was a, mo a motion to defer this application, I think we could look at that very sensibly. Can I just move that and check? And can I just say, um, I mean, not only, as you know, do I know because I've spoken to you about it, I, do I share what Ken Councillor Dean has said, but I actually think that the, the other thing as well in terms of our responsibility here is, is that the quality of debate and decision making has frankly deteriorated with the amount of time we've spent at it and it's just not the right thing to do. So I would like to suggest we defer and we bring this back and that we, we shorten the agendas for our future meetings. Right. Thank you, Chair. Uh, is there a, do you have a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Dinas. Okay, those in favour of deferring uh, WA 2020-1186 um, um, against and uh, no abstentions, right? Okay, members, thank you very much. Uh, I think we will all endeavor to shorten our agenda, especially to have three.